You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm a better player than a robot. Just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil that's it. And I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the second part of, What If Deku Joins Pokemon Verse? Smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Later at the lunch hall. After everyone had gone through hell and high water, having to do 50 more laps on top of their previous ones, Aizawa then kept them in gym beta to do even more exercises until lunchtime rolled around. All the students, especially the more athletic ones, were extremely exhausted and aching all over from the nearly non-stop working and moving around. Even Gar commented that he hadn't had a workout like that since he scaled Mount Silver at age 11. Gar even took Mimikyu with him to lunch, with the small creature being held in his arms. Although he wasn't supposed to have his Pokémon in the open, especially around other school students, Mimikyu did have the advantage of looking like just a toy so long as he was held and acted accordingly. Once they all got their food and finally sat at their tables, they all nearly melted right into them from sheer exhaustion. Some fell right to sleep, some fell face first into their food or the table, and some went completely stiff in their seats, while others were just too hungry to even care about being tired. One of them being Gar, who was now ravenously chowing down into his meat curry, meat pie, meat soup, and meat sandwich like a starving animal. He made the more horrible sounds when inhaling his food and had a whole list of other lousy table manners. Everyone sitting around him looked on in disgust as he mindlessly continued to eat. Having had enough of it, Ida spoke up and stated, gar -kun, can you please? Your table manners are absolutely horrendous. It's making us lose ours. Wah. Gar looked up to Ida with a full mouth and glazed expression. This only made Ida nearly vomit at him, which Gar noticed and swallowed the food remaining in his mouth. He wiped his face with his sleeve and asked, Sorry, what did you say, Tenya? Your table manners. My goodness Gar Kun, did your mother teach you nothing? Ida asked in a nauseous tone. Gar's face went from exhaustion to anger in 0.001 seconds as he threateningly pointed his fork at Ida and stated firmly, Don't ever bring my mother into anything. I, I am sorry, okay. But that's no excuse for your table etiquette. Ida put his hands up defensively. He's right. Ida Kun, you didn't have to bring his mom into this. Uraka stated plainly while mindlessly failing to pick up her food. My point still stands. Ida defended himself. Well, you could have just said that. Gar said while pulling his fork away and taking back his calmer expression. And besides, I've been on my own for a long time now. No time to think about table manners when you travel by yourself, sleep in the wilds, and train Pokémon. He explained while taking another bite of his food. I guess I can understand that, but while you're here in this prestigious school, you will be retaught proper table manners. Ida stated firmly. Yes, mom. Gar sassed him. Sorry, mom, we'll do better. Uraka added mindlessly. Well, make your proud, mom. Izuku also added, half awake. Please stop calling me mom. Ida said in a small and embarrassed voice. Yes, mom. They all replied in unison. This only caused Ida to blush and hide his face. A little while later, Mina eventually joined the table sitting next to Gar, who hadn't noticed her yet. She waited for a moment to see if he would acknowledge her or any of them, but Gar only continued to numbly much away. Hey gar Sam. Mina called for his attention. Gar came back to reality and turned to her with a half-full mouth, he said, huh. Seeing his derpy expression and puffy cheeks made Mina giggle a bit, so she quickly took a moment to take a pic of him. After pocketing her phone, she asked, So back at gym beat when you and Bakugu battled, you said something about typings. What is that exactly? The light returned to Gar's eyes. Hearing this and shaking himself awake, he swallowed his food and explained to her, Well, typings are a system of simplifying which Pokémon belongs in which group. Like your world's animal system, kingdom, phylum, genius, and species. Stuff like that. We have a more advanced system for Pokémon in egg groups, body shapes, height and weight, and so on. But typing is just a straightforward version. A Pokémon is usually given a typing group when taking into account lots of factors. At this point, Mina looked totally lost. Gar saw this inside while saying, Maybe I should just simplify it. If a Pokémon lives in the water and has features related to living in water, then it's a water type. If it lives in the cold, then it's an ice type. Fiery parts or a hot environment. Fire type. Spews toxic material and makes others sick. 
poison, though finding certain types for some Pokémon is harder for others. They either have to observe them in the wild or battle them with certain moves to see what works the most and least effective, then make a determination from there. Nina mulled over this for a bit of coyly asking, Suuo, since we are basically your world's equivalent of Pokémon, what would my type be? Your type? Gar questioned. Well, from what you told me about your quirk, I'd say you would be a poison type. This made Mina squeal with delight. What about me? What type would I be? Kaminari asked excitedly while sitting down with them. That's easy, pure electric. Gar pointed. Kaminar then did a fist pump into the air and cheered. How about me? Hiroshima asked while coming to the table. Rock or rock fighting? Gar answered. Hiroshima smiled with bright teeth. What about? Another person began to ask until Gar cut them off. Okay, you know what? How about I just go down the list and name it off in rapid fire, okay? Gar asked as everyone else was starting to move over upon hearing the conversation, nodded with him. Yuraka and Izuku snapped out of their tired trance to pay attention. Even the aloof Todoroki and distant Takoyami joined out of curiosity. Gar sighed and rubbed his chin. He looked around at where he should start, who was the easiest to identify and then move from there. He already did it with Mina, Kirishima, and Kamenare, so who's next? He just thought to do everyone at the table he's sitting at and go from there. So he turned and looked around and pointed at people. He said, pure water, fairy psychic combo, normal or normal fighting, pure fighting, pure fighting or fighting normal, electric fighting combo, fairy or normal fairy, pure normal, pure normal again, though you could squeak by with steel, pure normal or pure ghost or ghost fairy combo, dark flying, fire ice combo. He pointed to Tsuyu, Yuraraka, Sato, Shoji, Ajiro, Izuku, Aoyama, Koda, Jiro, Toru, Takoyami, and Todoroki in that order. Gar then stopped when he came to Ida and thought for a moment. After some silence, he finally said, I'm not sure what to put you as Tenya. I would say normal, but you got metallic parts so that you may be steel. And you also move really fast, so maybe flying. How do I count as a bird? Ida asked, confused. Oh, trust me, the flying type is very lenient. There are these two Pokémon called Daduo and Dadrio, who are wingless bird Pokémon who are flying types and can learn the move fly. I'm not sure how though, and I've never seen one use fly in a battle before. Suwu, yeah, one or the other, Gar explained. Ida obviously didn't like his answer but accepted nonetheless. Gar then turned his attention to both Siro and Minta and scratched his head. I don't know, normal or bug type, I guess. He shrugged. Bug. They both shouted. Why bug? Is it because I'm short? It's because I'm short, isn't it? Maita cried in anger. Gar put his hands up in defense and stated quickly. Well, there's nothing that says elemental about you two, and the closest thing that your quirks come close to in the natural world are bug types. Siro and Maita sank to the floor and muttered to themselves while softly sobbing about being compared to an insect. Gar sweat dropped at this and turned to the final person being Momo. He looked at her, and after about a minute of uncomfortable staring, he finally said, I have no idea. What? Some of them asked aloud. Just like that. One person asked. That's it. Another added. Yep. Gar replied simply. So does she not fall into any category? Izuku asked. Gar shook his head and replied. No, she falls into every category. What? How? Momo asks, surprised. Your quirk allows you to create anything. So you technically could create anything with different elemental or natural properties or uses. Gar explained as Momo looked on, trying to figure this out herself. All in all, if I had to put you into one category, it would be normal type. Normal type, that's it. One person asked incredulously. That's it. Gar replied while feeding Mimikyu his food. That's disgraceful, dude. Momo has way more skill than to be considered normal. Kaminari puffed out his chest in defense of her and everyone else I mentioned as normal should belong there due to their skill. He sassed him back. That caused Kaminari to lose his confident attitude and glanced over at everyone else placed in the normal type, as they glared back at him with daggers in their eyes. It's that or nothing. Besides that, she reminds me of two different Pokémon with their properties. Ditto and Arceus. Gar followed up. What's that? Some asked. Ditto is a Pokémon that can transform its body into just about anything. Gar explained. Hey, just like Momo. Kinda, Uraraka stated while looking at the girl, who was agreeing with the connection. And the other is the creator of my dimension and created everyone and everything in it. Gar said like it was nothing. Everyone stared at the young man with huge eyes and dropped jaws. No one moved, ate, or even replied, apart from Gar, who continued to share his food with Mimikyu. 
They didn't just hear what they thought they did, right? Wait, so this Pokemon Arceus is basically your dimension's version of God? Someone finally asked. Yes, he replied. And since you said you caught every Pokemon, that means you caught God. Another person asked. I guess I did. He shrugged. So you just compared Momo dot 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 to God. The same person asked again. Yes, he said simply. No one said a word until someone suddenly shouted. Momo is a God, everyone. Momo is a god. Momo squealed out in surprise and blushed at the connection, which causes someone else to shout out, All hail our lord and savior, Momo. All hail. The whole class cheered. You guys, please stop. Momo begged them as she hid her lobster red face into her hands. As everyone was cheering and Momo was slowly dying from happiness and embarrassment, Kirishima suddenly stated, Oh wait, we forgot about Bakugu. What type would he be? Since Bakugu wasn't there at the lunch table or in the lunchroom with any of them, the ash blonde was totally Mia. Dar snapped his finger and shot back quickly. That's easy. Dark fire combo. That made everyone laugh out loud until someone else asked. Let me guess, Aizawa sensei would be pure dark, right? Dar shook his head, which made everyone stop, until he replied, Don't be silly. He'd be a fairy type. This got another round of laughter from the class as they all joked around with each other on their typings or combos, which carried on till the end of lunch. In the hall, after lunch ended, the teens walked down the hall in a huge group talking amongst one another as they made their way back to their home class for their next heroics lesson. They still weren't at the classroom when Ida, who saw Gar's visible poke balls hanging around his belt, asked, Gar Kun, why do you have your poke balls out in the open? Aren't you afraid that if someone knew about them, they'd steal them and then use your Pokemon against you? Gar shook his head and replied, Even if someone did manage to snag one of my balls, they wouldn't open. Ida looked at him confused and followed up with, But we just saw Bakugusan use them but a few hours ago. That's because I allowed him to use them. He explained like it was simple. I think I can speak for all of us when I say we need more context to that statement. Momo stated, with everyone agreeing. Dar sweat dropped and explained, Sorry guys, I guess I forget you don't know how things work in my world. You see, we have these things called trainer IDs. Every trainer or someone with a Pokemon has one. It's basically something that's wired into the Pokeballs we own in order to use them. It's like a touch-activated thing. I don't know all the details. So if someone without a trainer ID or a different ID wouldn't be able to use someone else's Pokeballs, they just stay in rest mode. So when Katsukui used them, I simply deactivated the lock feature for anyone to use. Everyone seemed to understand and nodded to show it. And even if they did manage to hack or overwrite my ID, my Pokemon would never attack me. I've built unbreakable bonds with all my Pokemon, so I'd have nothing to worry about. Even if they did want to obtain my Pokemon and control them, they'd either have to mind control them, have me trade them, or steal them with a thief ball. He explained further. What's a thief ball? Someone pipes up. Gar put his arms behind his head in a resting position and explained. A specialized pokeball that is, as the name implies, designed to steal other people's caught pokemon. We're writing the person ID with their own. Hearing this new bit of info made everyone gasp. They didn't think it was possible, but if you could lock it up, someone could eventually break it open. But they're highly illegal, so anyone caught buying or manufacturing any would be granted the worst punishment possible. So many criminals or regular idiots are just too scared to attempt to make them. Gar followed up, seeing everyone's shocked expressions, which did calm them down some. Just as everyone was coming off that shock, Toru piped up and chirped out, So, off-topic question, what other Pokémon do you have? You said you could only have about six, and we've seen four, so who are the other two? Gar looks to where he assumed where the invisible girl's face was and replied, Sorry Toru, but that's a surprise. While bopping the tip of her nose, though only getting her head. Ah, uh, how uh, I hate suspense. Toru complained while waving her arms up and down. Speaking of Pokemon, what do you eat in your world? Ciro asked out of the blue. Gar looked at him with the most off-put expression as he asked back, Excuse you. You really like meat, right? He followed up. Gar nodded and replied, amongst other things, Yeah, it's my favorite thing in the world. My mom was always strapped for cash, so we had meat on very rare occasions. So when I sought out on my own and gained enough coin, I would eat meat all the time. Why are you asking? So then, you eat. Pokemon, Ciro asked carefully. Gar stifled a laugh and stated, Well, duh. Where do you think meat comes from? A tree, a farm, the supermarket. Everyone just stared at the older teen with expressions ranging from shock to disgust. Until Kaminari put it best, saying, 
That's kinda wrong, dude. I mean, you train, battle, and love these things like pets. And on top of that you, eat them. Don't you technically do the same with your world's animals? He asked back, to which everyone gained understanding expressions on their faces mixed with disbelief. Certain Pokémon have certain purposes, some are used in battle, some are more accustomed to domestic life, and some are better for eating. That's just how things are. And besides that, there are like a thousand different Pokémon. Don't you think at some point someone would try a few of those meats? Everyone still looked incredulously at these facts but nodded their heads nonetheless. Even Pokemon eat each other. For instance, Corsola is the favorite food of Toxapex, Walrene is the natural prey of Sharpedo, and Swellow loves to gobble up Wurmple. That's called nature. Gar gave some examples for the class to understand, which they did, albeit in small increments. My favorite is Slowpoke Tail. You'll never taste anything better. Gar recalled with happy sparkles in his eyes. What about the rest of it? Someone asked. Gar shook his head and answered, Nope, just the tail. The rest of the Pokemon is just disgusting. You see K. It's like a garbage disposal, it'll eat anything, and its body doesn't process it properly. So you kill a whole animal for a single part. One person asked with a horrified expression. Gar waved off the accusation and explained, Don't be ridiculous. That would be wasteful. You just cut off the tail. That's totally inhumane. Someone shouted in horror. Again Gar waved off the accusation and explained, No, it's totally fine. Slowpoke naturally lose their tails all the time. Sometimes, they just fall off for no reason. They grow back after a couple of days or so. And the slowpoke almost never realized that they're in pain. I actually keep a few slowpoke around just for the purpose of eating. Hearing this, everyone's faces of horror returned to normal as they understood more of Gar's world and the rules governing the use of Pokémon. Just like theirs, so if there were a problem, it would be taken care of properly while having science and rules dictated it. Gar then licked his lips as he added in, My favorite dish is sweet and bitter smoked slowpoke tail curry. MMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMM
However, the principal declined, saying there would only be pandemonium for so many people freaking out at once, also saying that the staff is well trained to deal with things like this. He didn't like the answer but accepted nonetheless. After everyone made it to class, they all showed heavy signs of being completely spent from yesterday's hell's ride of exercise, completely sore on just about every region of their bodies. Some of them could barely pay attention to the lesson they were being taught. Some looked half asleep, some looked like they were sleeping with their eyes open, and many others looked like zombies. And it didn't help that the day dragged on. It was nearly lunch when Aizawa returned to the room. After doing something outside the class and walking to the podium, he looked to his class. All of the students mentally prayed that Aizawa would go easy on them. After all, they could barely pay attention to his previous lesson. However, he surprised them all when he stated, Today, you'll be picking a class president representative. Everyone looked like the surprised Pikachu meme at his words, and we're in complete silence for several seconds until they all exploded and began to cheer with full excitement and for doing something normal for once. Some people even announced what changes or rules they would put into effect if they were elected. Then there was Maita, who, while drooling like a stoutland, was yelling about how he would have the girls wear very short skirts to school. However, he went quiet when he noticed Mimiku standing on his desk next to him with his beady eyes sparkling like a mad person, stroking his cheek with killer intent. Aizawa quickly silenced them by activating his quirk intimidatingly and saying, You all decide on who should be your representative by lunch. I'm going to the teacher's lounge to nap. Don't destroy one another in your decision making. And with that, the extremely tired man walked out of the room with his sleeping bag over his shoulder. Immediately after he left, Ida took the front of the classroom and told everyone that they should hold out a vote to see who among them would be most suited and well-trusted for the job. Mina said that would be stupid since everyone would just vote for themselves. Everyone didn't deny this, however, they decided to go along with the vote anyway with no other option available to them. Everyone was then handed a small slip of paper, wrote their candidate, and placed it into a literal hat. Gar even took one from Mimiku to write his answer, though this confused Kirishima, handing out the papers. Thinking he made a mistake, he tried to take the slip from Mimiku's little hand, but the Pokémon held onto it tightly and tried to pull it back. Kirishima just kept pulling back harder, having a game of tug-of-war until Mimiku finally had enough and hissed at Kirishima, who whipped his hand away. Ah, dude. Gar looked up to Kirishima. Why did you give one to Mimiku? Well, of course, his vote counts is silly. He answered, as cute as that is, Mimiku is pretty much an animal. We're counting people voting for another person. He came back. Gar tapped his chin with his own and replied, Well, Mimikyu and the rest of my Pokémon are going to be a part of this class, so it only seems fair that I give them a choice since someone will be regulating how I use them. Kirishima looked like his brain was buffering for a minute before replying, I guess that makes sense. So what about the other five? Only Mimikyu is interested in stuff like this, and I don't think the rest would be. But I'll ask anyway, Gar said while taking off two poke balls from his belt and tossing them into the air. They both popped open, and both Tojkis and Dragapult appeared in the class, drawing everyone's attention. You two want to vote for class president? Gar asked the two Pokémon as Kirishima smiled awkwardly and held out two sheets. Dragapult looked completely disinterested as he rolled his eyes and meandered around the class. Though, the Dreepy did snag the sheets and began to play with them while Tojkis took no mind to it and tried to sit its giant body in Gar's lap, practically smothering him as it cuddled up to his face. I guess that's two no's. All right, return. Gar gasped out while returning his Pokémon. Gar looked to Kirishima, who was eyeing the last three balls on his belt, and the older teen stated, Ha. Huh. No, I'm not bringing out Girados or the other two. Why not? He complained. Do you really want me to send out my 26 feet sea serpent into this tiny classroom? Gar asked rhetorically as Kirishima gulped dryly. Didn't think so. Also, if the first two didn't care, then neither would the other two. I know them well enough. Kirishima gave a disappointed sigh, pouted, and walked off. Before he did, he quickly turned around and asked, What about Rotom? Just then, the little phone Pokémon popped out from behind Gar and answered, I try not to get involved in politics, buzzed, and disappeared behind Gar. Kirishima shrugged and walked off. Gar wrote down his vote and folded the paper. He turned to Mimikyu, who was hard at work on his penmanship, and asked, So who'd you vote for? Mimikyu then immediately covered its paper with its arms and looked stressed at Gar. This reaction made him giggle and pet its disguised head. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have asked that. We're not supposed to be influenced by each other. It's supposed to be a secret. Gar condolences while putting his index finger to his mouth. Mimikyu also mimicked Gar's gesture which made him smile warmly at the Pokémon. 
After everyone wrote down their vote and placed it in the hat, Ida then went to the whiteboard and wrote down everyone's name on it, then put a tally mark next to everyone's name that he pulled from the hat. In the end, he found one last piece of paper but got a confused look when he read it. And one, scribble, he questioned aloud. Gar saw that it was Mimikyu's vote and spoke up, saying, Oh, that me the eye. He trailed off at seeing Mimikyu's anxious expression. He quickly changed it up, saying, I mean, that's quite the predicament. Let me see if I can translate it for you. Gar looked over to Mimikyu and saw a look of relief and satisfaction on its tiny face. Gar then walked up to the front and looked at Mimikyu's not-so-secret, secret vote. Lo and behold, he was right, it was just a bunch of scribbles. Normally Pokémon can't write a complex language unless they have hands, that level of intelligence or a psychic type, and Mimikyu did fall into any of those categories. However, Mimikyu did possess some degree of intelligence and would use art to convey what he was thinking. So Gar could easily decipher who he was voting for by seeing what he drew, a skill he picked up after traveling with Mimikyu since he caught him in the abandoned mart. From what he could see, it was definitely a person since it had a head with eyes, a smile, and hair. The hair was big, wild, and fluffy, the eyes were large, the smile was large and kind-looking, and the face had little dots all over them. What were those supposed to be? Blemishes. Oh, they were freckles. Now Gar could see who Mimikyu voted for. He took the chalk from Ida, placed a tally next to Izuku's name, and then took his seat. After all was said and done, nearly everyone had at least one tally by their names except for Ida, Momo, and Izuku. Momo had two, Ida had three, and Izuku had five. This, of course, surprised Izuku as he sat stiffly in his seat with a surprised expression. The crowd cheered, and Ida went over to shake Izuku's limp hand in congratulation and accept his position as vice president while going on and on with some boring speech. While Gar giggled at Izuku's reaction and Mimikyu cheered with the class. Lunch, later in the lunchroom, Izuku, Ida, Yuraraka, Gar, and Mimikyu were all sitting at the same table with Izuku unable to touch his food as he still kept the same stiff posture and frozen expression from when they were in class previously. At this point of seeing Izuku act like a quagsire in a motionless stream, his worry turned to be fed up and promptly slapped the back of his head only coming to this option when neither Yuraraka nor Ida couldn't snap him out. Izuku snapped out of his trance and nearly face-planted into his food from the slap. He looked at Gar with a painful yet betrayed confused expression. Gar sighed and said, Sorry, dude, but you weren't responding to anything. We exhaust all other options. I know it's surprising to be given such a position. But really, you're just being a drama jinx. Feel your backbone, accept it, and take it in stride. Izuku rubbed his head and meekly replied, Sorry. It's just dot 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 it's shocking, you know. I didn't think I would get the position at all or even a vote. It's just dot 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 so surreal, like a dream. I mean, why would anyone want to vote for me? Don't think of it that way. Midori-kun, you were chosen with the most votes for a reason. You are obviously the most trusted candidate. Ida reassured him. Yuraraka nodded. Gar took another bite of his meat meal and added in. Come on, Izuku, don't sell yourself short. You can't tell me you're not used to positive feedback. Izuku went silent as he looked down at his food. Gar had always been good at reading people, mostly due to being a trainer. And being a trainer meant you have to read your Pokémon at a moment's notice to change up the battle. So when he saw Izuku's reaction, he stopped eating and gained a look of disbelief which Mimikyu followed. Holy fucking Arceus, you are serious. He said in a serious yet low tone. Gar kun is right, Deku kun. You shouldn't sell yourself short. After all, I voted for you. Yuraraka broke in with her bubbly voice. What? Izuku exclaimed in surprise. As did I, Ida chimed in. You too. He followed up. Guilty. Gar said with his mouth half full, hand raised. Waha. Huh? Izuku stammered out, looking around the table. I may try to stay away from politics, but I would have voted for you. Buzzed. Rotom popped out. Izuku whipped his head around the table with a complete flabbergasted look as he asked in a shaky tone. You you guys mean it. Everyone nodded their heads. Izuku was so happy yet at the same time trying to hold back his tears, so he had a constipated look on his face as he quivered with happiness. After sniffing down his emotions, he realized something. And asking his friends, he said, But if that's true, then who are the other two that voted for me? Gar immediately saw Mimikyu tense up at the question and saw Ida look towards Mimikyu's direction. 
Knowing what he would answer, Sogar quickly cut him off and stated, Good question. Guess we'll never find out. This made Izuku smile, and Mimiku silently sighs with relief. As Gar took another bite of his food, without looking up at the others, he blabbered out. You know it's actually kinda funny. My original vote was going to be for Mimiku. Mimiku immediately stopped trying to snag Gar's food and looked up to him with a mix of surprise and happiness. Yeah, mine too. Uraraka added. I considered it myself. Izuku stated. At this point, Mimiku was acting much like Izuku previously did, whipping his head between voices in disbelief and unable to process what he was hearing. Buzzed, Mimiku for class one a president people, Rotom stated while Gar held him up on the palm of his hand. Mimiku was now just as much of a mess as Izuku was before, having a mix of happiness and shock with some embarrassment for flavor. He hid his blushing face into his little arms and shook back and forth with excited joyfulness. However, this cute moment was cut inexplicably short by the sound of blaring alarms. Everyone stopped in the lunchroom, silencing all conversation and ending all meals as the sirens blared off their ear-beating sound in everyone's heads. What's that? Gar asked over the noise. The warning sirens. Level 3 threat. Ida answered in a shout. And that means, Gar asked back, someone has broken through security and entered the school grounds. Ida half shouted. Soon the entire cafeteria was emptying out with a huge wave of confused and scared students leaving in a hurry. Gar picked up Mimikyu while Izuku, Ida, and Uraraka decided to stay back for a while, as things were starting to get a little crazy in the crowd with people starting to get into a panic. Unfortunately, all the teens were forcefully swept into the mob by other students, practically pushing them with their numbers. That's when things got really hectic, such as shoving, hitting, and even trampling over smaller students. Gar was bumped around quite a bit and knocked with elbows or kicked by feet so many times he began to bruise and become anxious. He hadn't felt this claustrophobic since his first time in Diglett's cave, being swarmed by Zubat every five feet. Mimikyu took quick notice of Gar's increasingly high emotional distress and state of health, which ticked the Pokémon off to no end. Mimikyu's eyes lit up like two sparkles as black matter began to swirl around its actual mouth. Gar noticed this and hugged the creature close to his body, and he chanted in a mantra, Please don't use dark pulse. Please don't use dark pulse. Please don't use dark pulse. Suddenly a loud noise that drowned out the alarm and other students' panic came over everyone's ear, causing them to stop. Then a large figure flew overhead and landed right on the exit sign while hanging from it like an apum. That figure was Ida, who announced to the panicking crowd that it was just the reporters and media that broke through UA security. He told everyone to calm down, separate into their classes, take a headcount, and calmly leave for their classes by third year first. And surprisingly, everyone did just that. Ida, Izuku, Uraraka, and Gar meet back up at their table with the rest of their class after everything starts to settle down and people go to group up with their classes. Gar rubbed the pain out of the bruise on the back of his head as he said, Nice timing Tenya, no really. Another minute and I'm sure Mimikyu would have been blasting several dozen people with dark pulse. Well, action had to be taken, and with everyone panicking, I had to work quickly. Ida stated as he moved his arms robotically. Are you okay, Gar? You look pretty beat up. You should probably see Recovery Girl, Izuku asked with concern. Gar waved it off and replied, I'm fine, trust me, I've been through far worse. Izuku didn't like this answer and stared up at him like a disappointed parent. Gar sweat dropped at Izuku's attempt to look authoritatively displeased and added, but I will go see her just to be sure. After all the classes had been separated and sent off to the respective classrooms, Gar left for Recovery Girl. After coming back with a clean bill of health, he saw Ida and Izuku discussing something, and from the looks on their faces, it was serious. At that time, Aizawa had come back and heard Izuku when he offered his position of president to Ida in front of the class. Ida was, unsurprisingly, shocked by this and asked why. Izuku commemorated Ida's quick thinking back at the cafeteria, saying how he not only deduced the reason for the alarms but also defused the crowd of students before they turned into a full-blown stampede. Both Ida and Aizawa asked if he was serious about this, and Izuku nodded. It was then decided that Ida would take the spot as the class present representative, and Momo would be vice due to having the most votes. Gar couldn't help but feel a little disappointed that Izuku gave up his position, but had greater respect in the decision, no less. It took an honest person to admit they were not fit for a role, and an even humbler one to just hand it down willingly. Back in his younger years, Gar wasn't so sure he wanted to be champion due to the responsibility it held. Heck, Izuku reminded him of his younger self so much it almost scared him on occasion. He knew something like being class president would be a great step for Izuku to be more confident, 
But alas, it's not meant to be. Oh well, after all, Gar didn't become who he was in a day, and Izuku certainly won't either. He'll help him along the path. Baby step, just baby steps. The next day, Aizawa informed them that they were taking their training to an off-site facility to get them used to the sounds and feels of rescue missions. Everyone was extremely excited as they donned their costumes and filed onto the bus for the trip ahead, albeit after some senseless instruction from the ever-serious Ida. They sat on the bus and tried to kill time by talking, sleeping, or listening to music, until Izuku noticed something was very off, well, actually, two things were off. So as Tsuyu and Kaminari were roasting Bakugu like a BBQ chicken, he turned to Aizawa and asked, Um, Sensei, where's All Might? I thought he was joining us. He had some last-minute work to do and will join us later. Aizawa replied without skipping a beat. Izuku looked around one last time and then asked, Where's Gar? That's when the whole class went completely silent, now realizing that their interdimensional friend was nowhere on the bus. Aizawa sighed and answered, he said, and I quote I'll take my own route there. What does he mean by that? Izuku asked as Aizawa shrugged. Look, Kaminari exclaimed while pointing to something out the window. Everyone crowded to one side of the bus as the driver shouted at them that they were going to set off the bus's alignment. Outside the window, in the river boarding, the cliff-bound road was none other than Gar riding along the stream on top of Girados's head like some kind of horse. Everyone marveled at this in amazement like a bunch of children, even though they've seen Girados plenty of times. Aizawa sighed in exasperation at this and continued his nap until they got there. Everyone still excitedly watched the older teen casually sit on the giant fish's head without a care in the world, and Girados cut through the water like it was running through the air, while fully keeping pace with the bus. Gar looked up from his resting position and waved to everyone on the bus, which they all waved back. Gar then did something that shocked them all and made them as giddy as a kid in a circus. He jumped off Girado's head while returning the creature into its Pope Ball. He then took out another Pope Ball at the same time, and Tojkis appeared right under him. Everyone cheered and hollered at this trick. Gar sat on Tojkis's back, and the bird egg flew over the surface of the water before flying up the cliff, then up and over the bus. Everyone tried to follow his movements but only saw the roof of the bus. They all shifted to the other side to see him but only saw the opposite side of the rocky cliff. What they did not know or see was Gar appearing on Tojkis at the same side they were all staring out before. Gar tapped on the glass to get everyone's attention, and when he did, he waved at them with a bright smile. Everyone shifted back to stare in wonder and amazement while commenting things like so cool or awesome where I wanna do that or what a ham or show off or stuff like that. Gar then stood up on Tojkis's back, which worried some of them, then jumped into the air, and watched as Tojkis performed several fast aerial spins and maneuvers like a performer. The Pokémon quickly adjusted itself in the air for Gar to perfectly land on its back and sit down. Everyone hooted and hollered with excitement as Gar did an improv bow like a stage performer. At the same time, the bus driver growls with agitation and Aizawa mumbled about them being too noisy. Tojkis then flew away from the bus's side and flew along, following it to the giant glass dome in the distance. Just as everyone unloaded themselves from the bus, so too did Gar finally land with Tojkis. The bird egg shook itself and chirped happily as it rested on the ground. Gar slid off its back, and like a complete ham, he exclaimed, Thank you, thank you, everyone. No, please, hold your applause. I really don't deserve such kindness. You are such a ham. Gyro playfully punched his arm. And you all love it. He shot back while sticking out his tongue. I thought you were told to not show your Pokémon out in public. Aizawa's tired voice stated rhetorically. Gar playfully punches Aizawa's arm while replying aloof, relaxes, eraser, no harm done. I'm very sneaky, so no one saw me traveling to this nowhere place. And besides, they need exercise. Being in the Pokeballs is fine, but having them out is where the relationship is built. He explained while petting Tojkis's head. Just try to abide by the rules, so things don't get crazier than they already are. Aizawa sighed. Once Aizawa was out of earshot, Izuku turned to Izuku and said, he really needs to lighten up. Izuku laughs nervously, that's part of his charm, I guess. Yeah, maybe, but my attack stat hasn't dropped. He joked while returning Tojkis. Wow, Gar-chan, your hero outfit is so cool. Kaminari exclaimed while looking over Gar's new hero outfit. Gar did several poses, even letting the hoodie fall past his shoulders to show off more, while saying, Thanks, I love how it came out. Soon everyone was crowding around the older teen and admiring or commenting on his unusual yet intriguing outfit that made him look like a Pokémon trainer and a hero mixed together. It looks like your outfit when you first arrived, Izuku stated. 
Gar smiled and replied, well, if the shoe fits. Gar's new outfit really did look just like his previous trainer attire, only with several slight changes. Instead of a muscle shirt, he had a full-body skin-tight bodysuit that covered all but his arms to the shoulder. It was also purple with black markings and gold trimming with a huge poke ball symbol in the center. He wore purple and black workout shorts with gold trim over them with black shoes with purple rim. He had two purple fingerless gloves with black markings. He's also wearing the same purple and black headband he always wore that separated his top half purple hair and bottom half black hair. He wore a belt with all six of his pokeballs and the same several fanny pack looking bags with little faces all around his waist that carried dot 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 well dot 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 and no one really knows yet. To top it off, he wore a hoodie that resembled the other one with big red eyes markings, a toothy smile in the back and little nubs on the top that looked like ears. The hoodie was open, and the hood was off his head. What's up with the fanny packs? Why the evil faces? Hiroshima asked. Oh, these. These aren't evil faces, they're ghost-type Pokémon. He explained while pointing at the packs. See, this one is Duskmoor, this is Sableye, and this is Gaugeist, this is Banette, and this is Kofagrigus, Palosan, Chandelure, and... Okay, okay, okay dude, we get it. You like ghost types. Ciro cut him off. Not really, I like all Pokemon. He explained. I always change up my style depending on how I'm feeling or what type I feel like using. So today, I'm feeling spooky. Woo well. He did a mock ghost scare. So what? Have you got the other 17 types of clothing getting made? Mina teased him. Yeah. He replied seriously. Then Aizawa's voice cut through the crowd as he stated firmly, You can admire each other's costumes and ask questions later. We're burning daylight here. Everyone then scrambled behind Aizawa and headed off into the giant glass dome. Once inside, everyone was taken in awe of just how massive the whole place was. Not only did it look near to a mile long and wide, but it was dug into the ground with the glass dome covering it. Along its trails were just about every kind of disaster you could imagine all artificial and placed in super-controlled environments. Even Rotom was so impressed that he popped out and began to take pictures of everything. There was a massive staircase that stretched down to the bottom but stopped halfway with a lookout platform. Everyone was in amazement until Gar piped up and made them all nearly double over from laughter. Wow, this place is so big it might just fit Katsuki and All Might's combined egos. Everyone immediately burst into laughter. Some were nearly falling over just from how hard they were laughing. Even Aizawa had to cough and sputter to keep from laughing. All were laughing except for Bakugu, who was glaring at Gar and cursing him up a storm but failing to come over the noise of everyone's screams of exuberance. After everyone caught their breath and calmed down, Ida approached Gar to scold him, albeit trying his best to stifle his chuckles. Gar can chuckle you shouldn't chuckle I mean you really chuckle it's not very heroic to chuckle. Ida couldn't even finish his thought from how hard he was trying to compose himself, nearly falling to his knees. Oh come on, dude, he is right. Kaminari laughs hard. Even Yue isn't big enough just for Bakugus. Gyro sassed while trying to keep her composure. This made everyone belly laugh again, this time with Gar joining in the laughter and nearly doubling over himself. When they calmed down again, a new person came onto the scene, also laughing with them. When they saw the new person, many stopped and awed before the new hero standing in front of them and laughing with them. The hero was dressed exactly like an astronaut, but with emoting white eyes under her helm and big yellow shoes. The hero gave a few more chuckles and then asked, What are we laughing at? Oh my god, it's the space hero, 13. Yuraka screeched like a fangirl while waving her arms excitedly at 90 degree angles. No way, one person exclaimed. So cool. Another added, I heard she was working here. Izuku fanboyed while blushing excitedly. Who? Gar asked, unimpressed. Yuraka whipped her head over to Gar and demanded in surprise, You've never heard of 13. Gar gave her a naturally displeased face, which she understood immediately, and calming down, she followed up awkwardly. Oh right, of course, you haven't. So her hero name dot 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 is just a number. Gar asked, confused by the bland simplicity. Haven't you heard of the space mission Apollo 13? Ida asked, Ooh. Gar made an expression like he realized the reference, only to immediately backtrack and say, Huh, I'll tell you later. Iraraka told him. Gar sighed and shrugged, and he said, I may not know her, but I do know a thing or two about space. Izuku looked at Gar inquisitively as the older teen came down to his level and whispered, I have a Pokemon that's an alien. It's called Deoxys. Izuku's eyes immediately filled with curiosity and excited sparkles at this. After 13 calmed down enough to speak, she welcomed them, saying, Yes everyone it is I, 13, and welcome to the Unforeseen Simulation Joint or USJ for short. 
13 then explained everything about the USJ, everything inside of it, and what they'll be doing as far as rescue training with her and using their quirks in a safe way to do so. As she continued, Gar didn't notice that one of his poke balls was shaking. Suddenly it popped open, and Mimikyu appeared behind the group and walked away. Gar caught the sound of a pokeball opening and looked around to see which of his Pokémon escaped. After a quick glance, he saw Mimikyu walking away from the group near the edge of the stairs. Mimikyu, Gar questioned, breaking away from the group and walking towards the small Pokémon. Luckily Mimikyu did not move down the stairs and instead stood right at the foot of them and looked over the edge towards the sprawling landscape of disasters. Gar came down to one knee and leaning down to pick the Pokémon up. He cooed, Hey there you are. What are you doing out of your ball, silly Pokémon? You like the view. Hiss. Mimikyu suddenly hiss aloud, causing Gar to jump back in surprise. Whoa. Mimikyu, you okay? What's gotten you all riled up? Gar tried to calm down the tense Pokémon. Just then, Gar saw what Mimikyu was hissing at and spotted a small black dot begin to appear while growing bigger. Gar immediately felt a sense of dread run up his spine as he scooped Mimikyu into his arms and slowly backed away. Without looking at the group of students, he exclaimed to them, Oh, guys, I think we should leave. Like, right now. 13 stopped her long-winded speech, Aizawa turned to him exasperated, and the rest of the class looked at him in confusion. What? But we just got here. Why do you want to leave? One person moaned. Hiss. Mimiku hissed even louder, gaining everyone's attention. I really think we should leave. Gar said in a dread-filled tone while pointing to the larger Grodot that now had two long thin yellow eyes. A pale, shriveled up hand emerged from the portal connected to the most terrifying person imaginable. If he were a slasher movie villain, then he'd be a tear. He was tall and lanky, very lanky. He has messy matted bluish gray hair, a black shirt, black pants, and a black overcoat with red shoes. The worst part of all was the several disembodied hands that covered his arms, shoulders, and head, with one covering his face like a mask. Behind him stepped out several dozen other people who could best be described as villains that just came pouring out like water from a faucet. What the? Aizawa exclaimed in genuine surprise. Whoa, cool. Walk villain invasion. This place has it all. Kaminari exclaimed excitedly. This is not a part of the training simulation. Thirteen warned them. Kaminari immediately sunk into himself in those worlds and meekly said, Oh dot 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 this is a real invasion. Thirteen, get the other students out of here. Kaminari, send a distress call. I'll handle the villains. Aizawa instructed the hero while putting on his yellow goggles and unraveling his capture weapon. I can't. Something's blocking the communications. Kaminari exclaimed in panic while tapping his headgear. Gar then thought fast and looked at the floating phone cowering behind Ida. He said, Rotom, see if you can bypass it. Buzzed, I can't. He replied in fear. Gar looked at him in incredulous shock as he shot back. What do you mean, you can't? Can you counter hack it or something? Rotom got so panicked he began to make panicked siren noises while half shouting. This isn't someone hacking the systems. This is a jamming frequency. Buzzed, it's like there's an electric barrier that keeps any signal from moving in or out. Buzzed, Gar ground his teeth and cursed, saying, Arceus damn it. Can you get into the system and bypass it yourself through all the fizz? Rotom stopped panicking for a moment as he thought to himself. A moment of deep thought and he replied, I don't know, but I'll give it a shot. Buzzed, Gar nodded with a serious and assured expression to the Pokémon and held out his hand. The phone flew over to the open palm, and the phone dropped right into it as Rotom popped out of it in his light bulb form. Good luck, buddy, Gar assured him. Rotom gave a mock salute while letting out a few electrical noises and was off like a bolt of lightning, sporadically buzzing all over the place before disappearing into a light fixture. Gar nodded at this and placed Mimikyu on his shoulder. He turned back to the oncoming flood of villains. And as for you, he said while taking out two poke balls from his belt and throwing them into the air. Girados, Volcarona, prepare for battle. The pokeballs opened and out popped the red Girados, sparkling and glittering in its shiny coat as it emerged, along with a completely new Pokémon that looked like a giant human-sized bug that radiated extreme heat. The bug was human-sized, which was really off-putting, but it looked something like a moth. Its head was black with large light blue eyes and two red horn-like antennae at the sides of its face that came from below to above the top. Its upper body was covered in fluffy white hair with four stubby legs poking out. Its thorax is divided into three parts with individual segments. The two on the side were light blue with black dots, and the middle was pure black. It flew in the air with six wings that looked like tiger lily petals, and its wings gave off an immense heat that started to make everyone sweat with every flap. 
What the hell are those things? One villain shouted. Are those monsters? Another one questions. Yue has war beasts. Another exclaimed. I didn't sign up for this. Another moaned in fear. Aizawa flung out his arm to stop the teen and firmly commanded him. No Gar, fall back with the others and get out of here. Use your Pokemon to protect yourselves. Gar gave him an incredulous look and sassed back. And you'll what? Take these villains all on your own. Fat chance. You're better with 1v1. And I can handle crowd control. Let's work together. Izuku popped in and agreed with Gar, saying, Gar is right, Aizawa sensei, your quirk isn't meant for combat, and if one of those stronger guys catches you or someone with a mutation, it's over. But with the two of you working together, you'll have a better chance of winning. Gar nodded with him. Aizawa gave a displeased huff and replied, I appreciate the thought, but I'm not someone trick pony. I'm a pro hero for a reason. This gave Izuku a dreaded feeling in the pit of his stomach while Gar clicked his tongue in aggravation. Even if he refused, he would still go with it. But you're right, we'll have a better chance if we work together. Aizawa followed up. Gar smiled at his responses, and shooting an arm out, he commanded his Pokémon. Then I'll take the lead. Volcarona, stun them with Bug Buzz. Giorados, use Dragon Pulse and hit as many as you can. Volcarona then began to vibrate its wings at such a fast pace that they emitted a high-frequency sound that could literally be seen by the naked eye. The noise was ear-splitting and so painful that several villains already climbing the stairs were forced to their knees from the pain ringing in their skulls. Once the villains were stunted, Giorados opened its mouth and shot out a beam of multicolored energy that took the form of a dragon head. The beam hit several villains and sent them flying all around. Giorados then shifted the beam all around to hit as many targets as possible. Villains and debris flew all over the place, and no one could reach the young heroes. Go, Eraser. I've got crowd control covered. You pick off the remainder and try to find the leader. Gar shouted at the tried hero. Aizawa jumped from the straight at the straggling villains that survived the attack and activated his quirk. As the stragglers saw the black-clad man flying towards them, some tried to attack with their quirks but quickly found that they had no control over them. Before they could even question what was going on, Aizawa wrapped them in his capture weapon and began to knock them out one by one. This continued in a pattern. Volcarona would stun a large group of villains, Girados would blast as many as he could, and Aizawa would pick off the remainders while looking for the leader. They only had to do this three times before things were manageable enough for Aizawa to take over completely. Izuku's eyes sparkled at seeing his teacher in action, and in a dreamy tone fanboyed, Sensei is so cool. Admire later, escape first. Gar snapped at him as Girados let loose another dragon pulse. Izuku fumbled with himself and then ran back to the class that was already making their escape. But just as they were mere feet from the door, the black mist with eyes appeared and took the form of a man, made of the mist in a full waiter suit with a huge metal neck brace, blocking the way. Hello Yue. He greeted them with a deep yet politely menacing voice. Thirteen then shoved several students behind her and activated her quirk. She shouted, Get behind me, children. Thirteen's quirk then began to rapidly suck up the mist man in huge quantities, almost completely sucking him in, until his mist body appeared behind her, and that's when he realized his quirk was some kind of gate mist. As Thirteen's quirk was used against her, the entirety of her backside was completely sucked up and shredded to pieces. The hero let out a panicked cry and deactivated her quirk just before passing out. Thirteen, Uraraka cried in terror. No, Izuku shouted. The mist man reformed and waved a smoky finger. He said, tsk tsk tsk. Such a shame, putting your student before yourself without thinking. He said while looking down at the unconscious hero, then looked back at the teen, ready to defend. Though I'm afraid to inform you that I cannot let you go under my master's orders. He then bowed politely and said, I come as a messenger from the League of Villains. We've come to kill All Might, but I see he isn't here. So you are the reason those reporters broke into UA. A student exclaimed. The mist man looked up and confirmed his notion. Indeed. But, enough talk. I think you all will come in handy for our plan. Once our followers have disposed of you, we'll use it against UAS image and all might to more easily assassinate him. He stated while narrowing his yellow eyes. Like the distortion world, you are. Shadow Claw. Gar shouted as Mimikyu, who snuck up behind the mist man, popped out with its beady eye glittering and quickly swiping out its thin three-clawed arm at the mist man's body. But the attack phased right through him, like a normal type move hitting a ghost type. Even Mimikyu was surprised by this. Gar momentarily froze and stuttered out in shock. Wah, it it went right through him. Attacks like that won't harm me, he explained. Gar ground his teeth and stated, then let's try something new. 
just before he could give Mimikyu an order. Even while Mimikyu took on its psycho face, the Mist Man agreed, saying, I couldn't agree more. Before anyone could do anything, Black Mist collected around all the teen's feet in a giant ring that was so big it even reached Gar, and his two Pokémon still defending the rear. The teens quickly felt gravity work against them and fell straight through the ground. Even Gar's Pokémon fell through the ground. Everyone tried to jump or move out of the range, but to no avail, and only failed like fish trying to escape. Even Gerardo's wriggled and roared with all its might to escape the sinking motion. Only Volcarona was able to escape, and the giant bug flew over to where Gar was sinking and dove down after him. A moment later, Volcarona emerged from the mist with Gar on its back. Thanks, Volcarona. Gar thanked the Pokémon with a cough. Gar looked around and saw the last few remaining people disappear into the mist and caught a glimpse of Gerardo's head sinking into the blackness before he could even pull a Pokéball out. Gar gasped and shouted in panic, Everyone! Gerardo's. No. Once everyone had vanished from his eyes, Gar let out an angry sound and threw out two Pokeballs in a fury. Togekiss, Dragapult go. He shouted as both Pokemon materialized from their capsules. We're under attack, and everyone has been separated. Find and protect anyone you come across. He commanded his two Pokemon in a firmly panicked tone. Togekiss immediately sensed Gar's distress and tried to fly over to comfort him. But the older teen stuck out his hand for the creature to stop, making Togekiss flinch at the gesture. Don't worry about me. I got this. Go, now. He shouted in a tone that left no room for discussion. Dragapult nodded its head, straightened out its body, and then flew off at mock speed in one direction. Togekiss froze in place from Gar's tone and reaction but listened after a moment and flew off in the opposite direction. Gar couldn't help but feel bad for raising his voice at Togekiss, but this was a crisis. Gar, the older teen heard his name called out. Whipping his head to the voice, he saw Aizawa hanging from a tree, like an apum. The pro hero pointed a finger out towards the center part of the field and exclaimed, That guy with the hands must be the leader. Gar looks out and sees the first guy that came through the mist portal still standing in the same place the whole time and appearing to be yelling at some of the villains trying to escape, alongside the mist man who shattered his friends to who knows where. He then saw Aizawa make a bunch of hand gestures and immediately understood what to do next. He gestured back and turned his attention to the two villains. Gar growled under his breath and commanded his Pokémon, Volcarona, land. The bug obeyed and landed on the stony ground where the large swarm of villains once were, only a few hundred yards from the hand leader, and the mist man lackey. Gar hopped off the bug and took out one last pokeball that he rolled around in his palm. He sighed anxiously and said to himself, one last pokemon, hope the two of you are enough. He then threw the ball into the air and shouted, go superior. The pokeball flew through the air and popped open to manifest a brand new creature before the villain's eyes. In simple terms, it looked like a giant grass snake in fancy leaf wear. In more complexity, it was a pale green snake-like creature far larger than a man. It even outsized Gar. It had a regal and noble yet snobbish complexity to its gaze with deep striking red eyes. Its pale green color had a helmet-like design to it with a white face. The back and upper portion of its long body are dark green. In the lower jaw, two fangs are visible when its mouth is open. There are two pointed yellow extensions on the back of its head. Coiled, dark green extensions spread out from the sides of its lower neck, forming a curving pattern lower down the body. Just below its neck, it has two small leaf-like hands coming out of either side. It has curved yellow markings around its middle and several pomate leaves on its tail with ivy-shaped leaves at the tip. When the snake landed on the ground with a powerful thud, it pointed its nose up in a high society manner, puffed out its chest, and let out a strange noise like that of a reptile mixed with a bird. The hand leader scratched at his neck and tilted his head to the side. He asked inquisitively, Kirajiri, who's the purple guy? The mist man, Kirajiri, tapped his neck piece while looking through some paper with a hum in his voice. I'm not sure. He must be new. There's no record of him from the data you collected. He answered with equal unsureness and unease. The hand man scratched his neck again and humid in his throat while saying in amazement. So, a secret side character, and he's a summoner with multiple familiars. Interesting. The only question now is, how do we get rid of him? Kill the familiars until the summoner is vulnerable or kill the summoner, so the familiars are vulnerable. I guess we'll test our new Namu and find out. He looked to Kirajiri and the Mist Man bowed while opening up a new portal. A moment later and a huge black hand emerged that was nearly the size of the hand guy. It pulled itself out of the portal and showed itself to be a truly disgusting thing to look at. It was like a human, with a human body complete with fingers and pants and everything. But it was bigger than a mudstail, more swollen than a matchamp 
had a huge yellow bird beak with visible teeth and unblinking dead fish eyes coming out of an exposed brain. Gar nearly vomited at the thing he was seeing and tried his best to keep his composure. He breathed a calming breath and, addressing the villains, he stated, So I see you have your own Pokémon. Never seen one like that before. Is it some kind of failed clone? He tried to vex them. The hand man scratched his neck on the other side and replied in a horse's tone, Is that what you call them? Pokémon, H-M-M-M-M-M, it has a nice ring. But no, my Namu isn't a clone. But it is an experiment. Allow me to demonstrate. At this, the Namu then got into a fighting position and readied to attack. Gar steadied himself again and pulled his Pokémon in close. He spoke in a low tone. All right, listen close you two. We've only got one shot at this, so you gotta be on your game, got it. The two Pokémon gave off silent cries of understanding. Gar smiled and said, good to hear. Now we gotta get their leader for this invasion to end early. So Volcarona, you'll distract that thing, while Superior sneaks up and restrains him. Both Pokémon nodded in response. They took the opposite side in front of Gar like a defensive position while getting into their attack-ready stance. Gar gave a bold smile as he thrust out his arm, yelling, then let's begin. Volcarona, use Heat Wave. And Superior, use Dig. Gar shouted in command. Superior then jumped into the air and burrowed underground, disappearing from sight. Volcarona's wings began to glow brightly and flapped them hard. From its wings, it blew forth a gale of searing hot air. The heat and air pressure were so intense that it not only pushed back the giant muscle but also scorched its already black skin. The heat was so intense that it actually began to burn and peel away chunks of its skin, leaving it raw and pink. The heat wave dissipated and left the giant creature steaming like a freshly burnt biscuit. A moment later and the creature's wounds began to heal all on their own. It used recover. Gar questioned in anxiety. Once it healed, the Namu charged at Volcarona with blinding speed, so fast that Gar barely had enough time to react. Dodge, he shouted, and Volcarona moved out of the way just in time. Quiver dance, he commanded, and Volcarona began to do a little dance that sent a red aura around its body. Good, now that Volcarona's special attack, special defense, and speed stats are up, it'll give him the edge to keep that thing distracted long enough for Superior to attack. Gar said to himself. Namu made a fast dash to swipe at the Pokémon, and Gar shouted in a moment, Bug Buzz. Volcarona moved out of reach and vibrated its wings, making the same sound it did before. Like with the villains, the Namu fell to its knees due to the sound and began to roar with pain. The hand guy was visibly shocked by this. He knew that his Namu was strong and fast, sure the Pokémon was keeping out of reach, but for how long? And its strength definitely outweighs the bug. But he never expected noise to hurt it or anything. It could heal and was practically an organic rubber. He scratched his neck in aggravation and shouted at Namu to just squash the bug. Once the noise stopped, the Namu recovered quickly and was already trying to grab Volcarona. But thanks to the stat boost, it was able to evade. Then ensued into a game of cat and mouse with once barely able to dodge or catch the other. The fight captured the hand villain's full attention as he didn't notice the moving soil coming towards him. Heat wave. Gar shouted at Volcarona and the Pokémon let loose another stream of searing hot air. This time at point blank, Namu's skin immediately began to flake and burn off. Some parts even ignited on fire. When the heat subsided, the Namu was still and smelling like a piece of burnt rubber. Then it surprised both Pokémon and Trainer when it suddenly lunged forward and snagged the giant bug Pokémon. Volcarona struggled to break free but to no avail, as Namu's strength was far superior. Even Gar was thrown off guard and fell to his butt in surprise. The hand man smiled maliciously with a sadistic gleam in his red eyes as he watched and waited in anticipation for Namu to crush the bug. But this distraction was all it took for him to get caught. A moment later and a large dark green tail emerged from the ground, surprising both villains enough for them to freeze up. Constrict. Gar yelled as the tail wrapped around the hand guy in a mere second while Superior's head emerged from the ground, shaking off dirt. Superior looked down at the villain with the most displeased and unimpressed expression alive as it tightened its grip and squeezed him with its body. The villain squeaked and panted as the snake Pokémon slowly squeezed him tighter and tighter, feeling his already thin and bony body begin to cave in and felt the sensation of his brittle bones breaking while his breath shortened. He couldn't even catch his breath long enough to concentrate as his vision started to fade in and out. All while Kirijiri stood by in frustration, unsure of what to do. The hand villain then noticed that one of his hands was free and tried to attack the snake. The villain's glare and speed were so quick that it made Superior lose focus for a moment until Gar's voice snapped the Pokémon onto attack mode again. Poison Fang 
Then, the Pokémon tightened its grip, opened its mouth, and bit down hard on the villain's forearm, keeping him from touching the snake. The villain screamed in pain from the bite and tried to wreck his arm free, but Superior just held tight. The villain was able to scream because Superior had to use some of her muscles for a different purpose and allowed a little bit of breathing room, though not too much, as Superior quickly began to switch gears and use both muscle groups at the same time. The hand villain looked to his underling for help, and the mist man finally came to his senses, taking out a gun and pointing it to Superior's head. Superior glared at the man with annoyance in her eyes. Meanwhile, Gar was looking to get Volcarona free from the monster's grip as it was slowly being crushed. Bug biz, he shouted, and the giant bug vibrated its wings again. The sound made the Numo release Volcarona and the Pokémon flew around the monster while continuing to make the awful sound. Since we can't knock its health down completely, we'll just have to weed it out. Use Giga Drain, he commanded. Volcarona then stopped buzzing and began to absorb green energy from Namu's body, which slowly reduced it to a more natural body shape. The Pokémon continued to fly around the monster while absorbing the green energy and making it look much weaker. To the point, its bones began to show through its dark skin. The absorption eventually stopped, and the creature was on its knees while breathing heavily. Seeing he had a chance, Gar looked towards the villains, with the mist villain pointing his gun at Superior's head, while the Pokémon held the leader in her coils while biting down on his one free arm. He then addressed the villain, calling them out and saying, Hey mist guy. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Kirajiri didn't put his gun down but still glanced at the older teen. Superior's cells are like a bamboo stalk, so they're at their strongest when constricted. Right now, her body has the same strength as steel. Even if you shot her in the head, it'll just bounce off and make her squeeze your leader tighter. Kirajiri looked back at the Pokémon, glaring daggers at him, and the hand villain was still screaming in pain while struggling to get free. His hand got shaky as he considered their dilemma, dropped his weapon, and turned to Gar, he asked, what do you want? Isn't it obvious? He stated, surrender and call off your Pokémon. I'm afraid only young Master Tamura is the only one that can control Namu. Kirajiri explained. Gar looked at the hand villain, Tamura, who stopped screaming due to being squeezed hard enough not to breathe, and commanded his Pokémon, Superior, let him have some breathing room. Superior obeyed and loosened her coils around her prey, allowing Tamura to breathe properly. The villain took in gulps of air as he finally felt his lungs again and dropped his head from exhaustion. He then looked up at Gar with pure hatred in his red eyes as Gar acknowledged him. Okay, listen up here, Hand Guy or Tamuro or whatever your name is. You're gonna call off your pet before it heals and give up, or Superior is gonna have the choice to squeeze you again or bite you with poison fang in a different place. He demanded. Tamura looked around at his situation. He was at the mercy of this snake thing. His Namu was still slowly regenerating. Kirajiri was useless at this point, and that guy still had one familiar to use. He could try to bide time so the Namu could get back to killing them. But then there's the snake and the fact he lost all feeling in his left arm from whatever poison was injected into him. That's not also counting the pro hero that was nowhere to be seen, so he was on a time frame. But what was he to do? He was angry, so so angry. He wanted to break free, rot the snake and kill the purple teen with his bare hands. But he was stuck. Suddenly the Namu, still laying on the floor, slowly regenerating its body, pulled as fast as one and dashed towards Volcarona and slapped it to the side. The bug flew across the area and rolled across the floor, though he quickly got back up due to Namu's failing strength. The Namu then roared, and its body inflated back to its super muscular frame. Gar panicked and fell to his butt, trying to get away from the monster. At the same time, Eraser Head, who was sneaking around the fight, emerged from the shadows and jumped into the air, trying to subdue Kirajiri with his capture weapon. But Kirajiri was quick and used the gun he still had in his hand to shoot Eraser. Luckily he missed his body and only got his shoulder. Eraser winched and lost concentration on the missed man as he disappeared from his capture weapon. With the distraction he needed, Tamura looked at Namu and yelled, Finish off the bug quick and then help me. Tamura then felt his body, breath, and voice crushed again as Superior tightened her coils. The racer head landed on the ground holding his shoulder but worked through the pain as he focused on the missed man with the gun. Namu dashed towards the Pokémon, still getting back up, and before Gar could give a command, the creature punched Volcarona towards the teen with extreme force. Volcarona sputtered out in pain as his body was thrown by the sheer force and grazed right past Gar. Gar watched as his Pokémon flew past him and then slammed right into a tree with such force that the plant broke. Volcarona, Gar shouted. The Namu then turned on its heels and ran straight for Superior, but Gar had enough reaction to give a command this time. Throw him and get away with Dick. 
he shouted as Superior threw Tamura at Namu and burrowed underground. Tamura slapped against his monster like a wet fish as Namu paid no mind and continued towards Superior's previous spot and punched the ground. Gar sighed with relief seeing his Pokémon escape until Tamura got up from the ground, clutching his limp arm, and gave a different command. Forget the snake and kill the purple summoner. He yelled as he pointed at Gar. Gar gasped as the Namu turned on its heels again and dashed towards him with blinding speed. Gar tried to run away, but his legs failed him as he tripped and fell on his face. He turned around just as Namu was upon him and covered his face for the life-ending punch. Suddenly Gar felt something wrap around his body and pull him away from the Namu just before it crushed him. Gar's arms were ripped from his face by the pulling force, and he saw Aizawa some ways away using his capture weapon to save him. Just then, Tamura snuck up behind Aizawa, and as he was distracted saving Gar, he grabbed his elbow with his hand, and the man's arm began to decay. The rotting happened so fast that the muscle underneath his skin began to show. Aizawa winched from the pain but still pulled through to move Gar to safety. The racer, Gar shouted in fear. Just like you heroes do, you put others before yourself and don't finish the job leading to your own demise and others. You could have taken us down and only had one casualty. Tamura vexed him as he gripped his elbow harder. Aizawa said nothing and tried to attack the hand man, but he moved out of the way before the blow could land. Aizawa's breath was now ragged, and his right arm was just barely holding up as it bled heavily. I would have killed you right there, but I'd like to see you suffer first and use my quirk on someone more deserving of it. So I'll let my Namu take care and finish you off first while I rot your summoner myself. I'll be sure you have a front row seat to watch. He smiled coldly at him. Before Aizawa could retaliate, Namu was already upon him and slapping him around like a piece of raw meat. Gar froze at this sight from the fear that ran up his skin. But he pushed it away and shouted, Superior, save a racer head. The moment those words left his lips, Superior appeared from the ground the Namu was standing on and began to wrap around it. She wrapped once around the Namu's arm and one around its neck. Superior squeezed with all her might and began to choke the Namu out while pulling its hand away from Aizawa, who was pinned under it. The Namu roared as it choked from Superior's strength, but the Namu was still stronger as it grabbed one of the Pokémon's coils and tried to peel it off. Gar saw this and commanded the Pokémon, Poison Fang. Superior opened its mouth with purple fangs and bit down right on Namu's exposed brain. The monster roared in pain and let go of the Pokémon coiled, allowing her to squeeze harder. The Namu tousled around trying to whip the Pokémon off, but Superior just held on tight. That allowed Aizawa to come back to his senses, and the man tried to pull himself back to his feet, trying to work through the pain all over his body. Tamura didn't like how his luck shifted away from him yet again and commanded Namu, Stop screaming and peel that snake off you. The Namu obeyed, and with its free arm, it grabbed the Pokémon and pulled it off in one swift motion. However, this also made it pull off a bit of its brain from where Superior was biting down. The Namu pressed on as it slammed Superior on the ground multiple times before throwing the Pokémon against a nearby boulder. Superior crumbled down and laid on the ground in an unresponsive state. Gar gasped at seeing his Pokémon be puny god by the monster and had to hold himself back from running towards her. However, Superior opened her eyes and tried to bring her head up. Gar sighed with joy at seeing his Pokémon still well, but it immediately dropped when he saw Namu rush towards her again. Leaf Storm. He shouted. Superior forced herself up and let out a cry. Many leaves came from her body, along with leaves from every nearby plant, and rose into the air. Superior then roared in Namu's direction, and all the leaves swirling around like a storm right at the monster. The leaves sliced up the Namu and halted its charge towards the Pokémon for a brief time. The storm quickly picked up double speed and then began to make huge gashes and cause chunks of the monster to fall off. Once the storm subsided, the Namu took off again, causing Superior and Gar to freeze up in fear, giving the monster enough time to close the distance and punch Superior straight in the face. Superior flew upwards from the punch's force and passed out once she hit the floor with swirls in her eyes. Namu was about to finish the job and smash Superior's head but completely missed when Gar took out his pokeball and safely returned the creature. Superior, return. He shouted as, Superior's body turned into energy, which was what the Namu punched. Gar then pocketed the pokeball and ran towards Volcarona, who was still slumped against the tree. As he checked his Pokémon, Namu went into position to attack Gar, but Tamura held up his arm and stopped Namu's intended attack. No, 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 Namu, he's mine. You can go back to playing with Eraser Head. He told the monster as it retackled Aizawa and held his face to the ground while smashing it into the ground repeatedly. As Gar was distracted, Tamura ran towards him with rapid speed. 
Gar heard the footsteps as Volcarona was coming to and saw the villain charging towards him. Gar froze for a moment out of fear but forced himself out of it and stood between Volcarona and the villain with his arms spread to block his hurt Pokémon. Kimura smiled wickedly at this, seeing as it made him more vulnerable while causing excitement to shoot through his body, causing him to run faster. Gar was scared out of his wits and not thinking straight, but stood from waiting to take the blow. Volcarona saw what his trainer was doing and looked on in amazement and horror at what would happen. He vaguely knew something terrible would happen after hearing the fight between Superior and that thing moments ago, especially for the amount of fearful yelling Gar was doing. Volcarona was filled with a new sense of energy and determination in his body. He wanted to get up, he wanted to fight. He wanted to protect Gar from any harm, and he is going to do so. Volcarona spread its sore wings and lifted up into the air, then flew right in front of Gar, protecting him from the incoming villain. Gar was shocked by this and exclaimed, No, Volcarona, don't do this. You're still hurt. Let me protect you. But the protest fell on deaf ears as the bug Pokémon stood firm with a furiously determined expression on its insect face. Tamura smiled wider at this and shouted maliciously, How touching, I'll de-wing your bug and then rot your head off in front of it. Tamura closed the distance with the last word and immediately grabbed one of Volcarona's six wings, which was the wrong part to grab. The moment that his fingers grazed over the scaly wing, Tamura's entire body went up in flames. He screamed in agonizing pain while jumping away from the bug and rolled on the ground, trying to put himself out. The screams were so loud it actually drew Namu's attention thinking he was being given a command. Kirajiri noticed this immediately and sprung into action. Using his warp quirk, he opened a portal over Tamura that gushed water onto him from another part of the facility. Once thoroughly soaked, Tamura stopped rolling around and screaming and laid there on the ground, breathing heavily while trying to satiate the pain of the flames. He looked up at Gar, who had a shocked expression for a moment before it turned to one of pride, which ticked Tamura off. I probably forgot to warn you about touching Volcarona's wings. They are said to be as hot as the surface of the sun. But don't worry, Volcarona would never purposefully burn someone dot 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 he didn't trust. He stated with a smug tone while the bug chattered his mandibles. Tamura ground his teeth and tried to pick himself back up, but the screaming pain of his body refused. Kirajiri appeared next to Tamura and began to treat him. Once the two villains were distracted, Gar looked over to Aizawa and saw that Namu had gone back to slamming his face into the ground. Gar immediately felt the urge to help, but he didn't know how to. Four of his Pokémon were gone, one was unable to battle, and the other was just barely hanging on. So what could he do to help? He couldn't just fight that thing. He'd die. Just then, Volcarona, who sensed his distress, nuzzled him to calm him down. Gar hugged the giant incense fluffy white upper body and whispered in despair, Oh Volcarona, what'll I do? I can't help Aizawa, but I have to, or else he'll die. And he's only in that situation because of me. The Pokémon then pulled away from Gar and began to fly towards Namu. Gar immediately knew what he was doing and spread in front of him, saying, No, Volcarona, you're too hurt. Those things are too strong, and you barely survived the last hit it gave you into that tree. Volcarona tried to move past him, but Gar refused to let him go, exclaiming, No, I'm not letting you fight any further. You're going back into your Pokeball to rest, and that's final. Gar then took out the bug's pokeball and was about to return him when said Pokémon grabbed the device and flew up high enough that it was out of his reach. Hey, give that back, he shouted at the Pokémon, but Volcarona wouldn't listen. Gar stopped trying to jump up and snag the ball from him, realizing that the Pokémon was serious. Seeing him stop his painfully pathetic attempts, Volcarona flew back down to Gar's eyes level. They both looked each other in the eyes for a long while. Volcarona, seeing Gar's worry and fear, and Gar seeing Volcarona's fiery determination. You're really serious about this, aren't you? Gar asked the Pokémon. Volcarona nodded while letting out a few bug noises. Seeing there was no way of convincing the bug Pokémon, Gar conceded to his desire. Volcarona gave Gar back its Pokeball, and the older teenager put the ball back on his belt. He then went into one of his pouch pockets and pulled out a light green spray bottle device labeled Full Restore. He gripped the bottle tightly in his hand and said in a low tone, Last one. Better make it count. Gar unloaded the context of the bottle on his Pokémon's body, and Volcarona looked visibly healthier and stronger. Volcarona then flew out, ready to fight, but Gar stopped him one last time, saying, No. If you're going to fight that thing, you're not gonna do it alone. Volcarona immediately knew what he meant and positioned itself to where its back was at a 180-degree angle. 
Gar smiled and climbed on the giant's back, gripping to his fluffy white body like reins. The Pokémon flapped its wings hard and flew like a rocket towards the monster still pounding Aizawa. They passed by the two villains as Tamura was starting to heal up from Kirajiri's treatment, leaving a trail of hot air in their wake. They were just about to the Namu when Gar shouted for its attention. Hey monster. The Namu stopped its assault and looked up at the older teen riding Volcarona. Once they were close enough, Volcarona then flew up and spread its six wings as they glowed with dangerous brightness while letting out an angry cry. Let go of Aizawa right now. He demanded of the monster. The flood zone. Izuku's first feeling was discounted. The feeling you get when your grip on reality is pulled slowly away from your fingers. And that's what he felt when he fell through the floor, disconnected through weightlessness. The sense of not being in any control and watching the world work against you. You feel yourself falling, but you didn't fall on your own. You had no control, and now everything from breathing to moving feels out of place or non-existent. Only when Izuku hits the water is when his sense of control and connectivity comes back to him. Wait, what? Water? When did that happen? Izuku almost tried to gasp in panic, but the moment he felt the cold water hit his tongue, he shut his lips tight. He looked around the water to see where he was in the surface but only saw several aquatic villains all around him. He tried to get to the surface but got targeted by a villain with a shark quirk swimming after him. Izuku panicked and tried to swim faster, but the shark was already at his heels. Just when things looked over for his short heroic career, his saving grace came in the form of the frog girl Tsuyu, who slammed into the shark with her feet. She then shot out her tongue, wrapping it around him, then using the shark villain's face as leverage, she bolted through the water with him in tow. A moment later, Izuku lost his senses again but got them back when he found himself on the wooden deck of a ship with Tsuyu, who looked annoyed, and Maita, who was rubbing a lump in the back of his head. Izuku shook himself back to reality and saw that he was in the flood zone of the USJ on a mock sinking ship. Down below swam several water-based villains circling the ship like hungry sharks. Izuku and his team had to think fast as the villains were becoming impatient from waiting, and the ship was beginning to sink. This didn't help Izuku's train of thought due to Tsuyu's unneeded bluntness and correcting her name, and Minta was screaming about dying as a virgin. Izuku needed to think of a plan, but he kept drawing a blank when suddenly he heard a very familiar set of bird-like chirps. The group of three poked their heads up from the ship's railings and saw none other than Tojkis flying towards them with a distressed look on its face. Izuku knew how powerful Gar's Pokémon were and could come up with a plan using the powerful animal. But first, he'd have to get Tojkis' attention over to them without being noticed. That was going to be complicated with all the villains around them. Sure they were trapped, but they had the advantage of not being seen on which part of the ship they were hiding. Izuku looked at Tsuyu, who seemed to understand his thoughts, and nodded at him. They'd now have to figure out some way to discreetly let Tojkis know they were there before it flew off. That is until Minda did that for them and indirectly shouted, If you want to convert the given text from uppercase to lowercase, it would look like this. Bird egg. Over here. Over here. Save us please. Tsuyu's tongue immediately wrapped around his mouth, silencing him, and pulled him down from the villain's sight. That captured the Pokémon's attention, but also every villain who had ears. Immediately the same shark villain from before, with a new purpose, popped up from the water and right at the young hero hiding spot. I'm gonna kill you brats. He shouted as he opened his sharp mouth. Izuku panicked. Tsuyu froze, and Minta was screaming like a girl with Tsuyu's tongue still wrapped around his mouth. Before he could even inch closer to them, something struck him on the side of his head. The villain looked over to see what hit him and saw Tojkis with the angriest expression it could muster, even though it looked cute while doing it. It wasn't the forced angry expression but the fact he saw the flying egg bird in person that made him flinch in surprise. The hell are you? He asked the Pokémon. Seeing the villain distracted and coming up with a plan on the spot, he punched the villain away from them and commanded the Pokémon. Tojkis, use Thunder Wave. Tojkis, surprisingly, obeyed and sent out a wave of electricity that paralyzed the villain in one shot. The shark man froze up from losing control over his body and fell off the ship's railing and back into the water with a loud splash. Once the villain was out of sight, Tojkis landed near the teens and began to snuggle into them, happily chirping up a storm. Minta hugged the egg bird and began to weep into its white feathers while Tsuyu and Izuku petted the creature, trying to calm it down. I'm happy to see you too, Tojkis, but you have to stay quiet. Otherwise, we'll have to deal with more than one villain. Izuku tried to calm the Pokémon down but stopped once he saw the tears in its eyes. What's wrong? Tsuyu asked the bird. Tojkis sighed sadly and began to make a series of much more silent but sad chirps and whistles. Unfortunately, none of them could understand the Pokémon, 
and once said Pokémon realized this, he dropped his head in despair. Izuku awkwardly petted the animal's head to bring its spirits back up as Tsuyu followed suit. There there, Tojkis, it's alright. We may not know what's the matter, but we'll figure it out after we're all safe. Okay, Izuku asked. Tojkis picked up his head and chirped happily. Seeing now that they were all in the game, Izuku planned with the people he had. Already knowing more than enough about Toxus's type and abilities, he turned to Tsuyu and Minta and asked about their quirks. Tsuyu explained her frogginess, and Minta explained his lackluster sticky balls, crying at the end. Putting it all together with his own quirk and Tojkis, he thought up the craziest plan that might just work. He explained his plan to his group and put it into action. Summoning his inner Kakan, he jumped onto the railing and yelled bloody murder into the moxie. The villains looked confused at this until he jumped from the railing over the water and blasted a shot of one for all into the lake. The blast was so powerful that it caused a whirlpool to form. The villains were carried off and swirled around by the strong current as Tsuyu grabbed Minta under her arm and jumped off the ship while grabbing Izuku with her tongue. Minta then started throwing his sticky balls into the water, which caused the villains to stick to one another and restrain them. Tojkis was next as he flew over the surface of the whirlpool and made it spin faster as he used air slash to generate more speed. Once the whirlpool was at its climate speed, Tojkis used thunder wave to shock the water and cause several villains to become paralyzed. Tsuyu's jump was more than enough for them to escape the whirlpool's pull, but just for safe measure. Tojkis flew in and caught the frog girl on his back. Once Tsuyu dropped Minta and pulled in Izuku, all three teens situated themselves on the egg bird's backs, and the Pokémon flew off towards the shore. As he flew across the water, Tojkis hoped he could make it back to help Gar, knowing full well he was in danger. The Mountain Zone, Momo's first thought when she found that Kaminari, Gyro, and herself were trapped in the middle of a mountain region and at the bottom of one, surrounded by several villains, they were totally in trouble. Yes, Momo refuses to curse, even in her head. Momo created a bow staff for herself and Gyro a sword, Kaminari activated his quirk, and the fight commenced. Momo does her best to hit as many villains while keeping tabs on her teammates. Gyro used her jacks to plug into the villains or her boot speakers while using the sword to block attacks and make openings. Kaminari was doing his best to shock any villain to unconsciousness without going over his watt limit. They were doing considerably well, but the villains just kept coming, until Gyro told Kaminari to do something. And the electric teen said he was, but the connection was still jammed, and his quirk was dangerous to use around the girls since he could hit one of them. Gyro got annoyed with his answer and kicked him while shouting at him to get in the game. Kaminari slammed into one of the villains, and the man illuminated like a light bulb from his electricity. Kaminari saw this and said he was like a human taser while thanking Gyro with a thumbs up. At the same time, Gyro sighed at seeing him forget how his quirk worked. The villains started to surround them by the dozens and made the teen go into full defensive mode, but the three of them were already pitifully outmatched and outnumbered. That is until a large red object fell through a portal and landed with a loud crash on top of one of the fake mountains, garnering everyone's attention. The red thing lifted itself and roared into the air, a loud bone-chilling roar that made the villains freeze up with fear. The object turned around, and Girado's extremely pissed-off face showed itself before the already frightened villains. What the hell? One villain shouted while pointing at the Pokémon. A monster just fell through the sky. Another screamed. But it's not our monster. One specified. Who's it then? Where did it come from? Another asked. Maybe it's on our side. One other put forth hopefully. But that hope was immediately dashed as Gerardo saw the group of villains surrounding the three teens and began to blast as many as he could with a powerful dragon pulse. The beast sent rubble and villains alike flying all over the place. Some tried to run from the blast but were caught up in it before they could even turn to run. Once the beam subsided, Gerardo's crawled down the hill towards the surrounded teens. Villains began to run away from getting crushed by the giant fish, leaving multiple gaps and openings for the young heroes to use. Once Gerardo's reached the teens' side, he roared in warning at the remaining villains. It's with the heroes. One villain shouted. Not fair. Another complained. I don't want to become fish food. Another screams in fear. They said this would be easy. Another complained. Kaminari gave a snide smile and stated, Well then, I guess your easy time just became a bad time. Kaminari then opened his mouth and pointed his arm out, as if to give a command. But no words came out as he stood there, forgetting what moves Gerardo's has. He quickly turned to the two girls and asked quietly, Anyone remember what moves Gerardo's has? Gyro slapped her forehead and said, You really are a dunce, you know that. 
Gerardo's nose dot 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 okay, now I forgot too. Gyro failed to recap the fish animal's abilities. Momo sighed in exasperation at their twin dunsery and looked at the giant fish, waiting patiently for a command. She exclaimed, Gerardo's, use hydro cannon. Gerardo's then opens his mouth and shoots a torrent of pressurized water at the villains. All of them tried their best to run, but were too slow for the torrent's speed and Gerardo's aim. Rocks flung all over the place, along with the screaming or unconscious bodies of villains. Gerardo's took a break to roar and continued his aquatic assault on the low lives. Gyro, Kaminari, and Momo looked on at this in amazement and fear. Man, these things ain't called the atrocious Pokémon for nothing, Gyro stated while eyeing the carnage around them. One of the villains did manage to get away from the attack due to having wings. The winged villain waited for his chance and swooped into Gerardo's head when he needed to rest. The villain grabbed the Pokémon by his head crest and held on for dear life as the fish flung his head around. He then turned his wings into two sharp blades when he folded them up and pointed the tip threateningly at Gerardo's eyes. He asked a snarky question to the animal. Why to call a fish with no eyes? He asked while bringing the tips closer, though he never got a chance to answer as Gerardo's used thunder and fried the winged villain. The villain fell to the ground as Kaminari answered for him, A-F-S-S-S-S-H-H-H-H. Kaminari laughed at the joke while Gyro and Momo facepalmed. However, their victory was short-lived as the remaining villains, and more of them came out of nowhere and began to swarm them. Gerardo's tried to intimidate them but to no avail. Momo then thought quickly and came up with an idea. She then told Kaminari to let out all his juice as Gerardo's as thunder supercharged him. Kaminari initially refused, knowing his quirk was uncontrollable, and could hit the girls without him knowing. But Momo has a plan for that and created an enormous insulated sheet over her and Gyro. She told Kaminari to go wild, and the electric man smiled in reassurance. You heard the girl Gerardo's. Let's fry these suckers. Kaminari shouted to the Pokémon. Gerardo's roared and generated electricity around its crest. The villains tried to swarm the teen before he could let loose, but Gerardo's already sent its thunder directly into Kaminari's body, supercharging him. Kaminari then shouted a war cry and released all his electricity at once around the whole area. The villains' bodies illuminated like light bulbs, and their screams of pain could be heard over the roar of the zapping electricity. A minute passed, and the attack eventually subsided. Gyro peeked out over the landscape of unconscious villains laid all over and commented, Geez, Kaminari sure is powerful. If he could actually learn to control that quirk of his, he might just be one of the most powerful heroes today. I know what you mean. It's a good thing I made this insulator sheet with double the reinforcement. Momo agreed until Gyro looked at her and froze. Momo wondered what was wrong with her friend until she looked down and forgot about her state of undress. Momo always had a problem creating big objects due to them constantly tearing apart her clothing. She reassured her friend it was okay since she could just make a new outfit. Then Gyro caught sight of Kaminari walking by their sheet and immediately covered her friend's body while yelling at him to look away. The thought was dashed when they heard him reply, Way. They looked back at him and saw Kamiari with the derpiest face while doing the dumbest moments with double thumbs up. He was virtually acting like a dumbass. Then Gyro remembered that when Kaminari went over his watt limit, he would go dumb for about an hour. So she got out of the sheet with Momo, who had made a new outfit, and looked around at the scene before them. They wondered where Gerardo's was until they saw the large redfish laying on the ground with electricity arcing in certain places around his body. Gyro slapped her forehead and yelled at the brain-dead Kaminari, you idiot. When I said go nuts, I didn't mean you hit Gerardo's as well. He's a water and flying type. You probably knocked him clean out. Now how are we? Kaminari-kun is still incapacitated. Momo cut her off. Way. Kaminari replied with his derp voice. Gyro sighed in aggravation while rubbing her temples, I know. I just needed to vent that. I would have thought he'd try to arch his power away from the giant fish behind him. Suddenly the ground under Kaminari's feet broke apart, and a huge muscular man in a skull mask burst from the ground and grabbed the electric teen by his collar. Gotcha you little brat, he shouted while holding the teen off his feet. What the? Gyro shouted in surprise. How are you still up? Kaminari should have gotten you too. Gyro exclaimed. I'm also an electric user. Electricity doesn't affect me in the slightest, and I still need to be active to block UA contact. The man explained smugly, so you're jamming the radio signal. Momo theorized. The man gave a small chuckle. I am. Though I do feel bad for using my fellow electric user as a hostage, I feel a certain kinship to him. But I'll make an exception this one time. He says threateningly as electricity arcs around his other hand while bringing it closer to Kaminar's head. 
Kaminari Kun, Momo shouted in fear. Way, the teen derps again. Now surrender, the villain demanded. Damn, he got us with our pants down. Gyro cursed under her breath as the two girls put their hands up. The villain had the smuggest smile on his face with a hidden malak that hid another part of him as he looked up at Momo and Gyro like two pieces of meat, making both girls shiver with disgust as they felt the villain eye fucking them. Just then, a large shadow loomed over the villain and heroes, making it seem like night suddenly fell. The villain was more than confused by the shifting light and asked, Hey, why'd it get so dark? He turned around and nearly fell to his butt while gasping in fear of the looming threat above him, looming over with the aura of a cold-blooded killer, looking down to seem imposing and large, was none other than Girados. The villain was sure that the kid's attack knocked it out cold like the rest of his comrades. But here it was, standing over him with the coldest aura he's felt. Girados' eyes are covered over by a shadow with only his red irises bleeding through the darkness. His mouth was closed, but his teeth were visible, and a low hiss was heard emanating from his throat. The villain was so shocked and scared that he didn't dare even breathe not to set off the Pokémon to attack him. Then Girados did something unusual and adjusted its tail fin in the front with it pointed out and up like the palm of a hand. It waved its fin as if asking for something to be placed on its fin. The villain took a minute through his fear to figure out what the fish wanted, and laughing nervously, he put Kaminari onto the fishtail. The villain put his hands up defensively as slowly back away as Gerardo's pulled his tail back. Then a strange light emanated from Gerardo's mouth, and the fish shot a hyper beam directly above the villain at point blank. The girls covered their eyes from the blinding light, and when it subsided, they saw the charred and unconscious electric villain laying on the very burnt, and broken ground with Gerardo's roaring into the air. Shit. Gyro curses at seeing Gerardo's work. Gerardo's then arched his head down to the girls as Momo pets the giant fish to assure him they were safe. That made Gerardo's give a slight purr. Okay, I officially respect Garmore for being able to control you. Gyro said while cautiously petting the Pokemon's head. At the mention of Gar's name, Gerardo's made a bark with a hiccup. Almost as if asking or longing to see him. You miss him, don't you? And you're worried. Momo asked. Girados made a small noise that sounded sad, thus confirming Momo's question. We're worried about our friends too, so let's go save them. Momo stated confidently. Girados roared in agreement with the girl and arched its head down towards them. You want us to ride you? Gyro asked. Girados gave a slight purr. No argument there. She followed up while climbing onto the giant fish's head with Momo. Girados then put Kaminari's derp body onto his head, roared, and caterpillars through the mountains following the gar's scent. The ruined zone. Back Hugo and Kirishima were immediately ready for a fight long before they were dropped into a portal, and were more than ready when they found themselves in a ruin with several dozen villains surrounding them and prepared to beat them. Back Hugo also wondered briefly if this was how Gar felt when he came to their world from the portal. Although the two teens were grossly outnumbered, the villains were outmatched. They held up considerably well against the oncoming wave of scum and their circumstance. But tight space and the little room worked in their favor since both were close-range fighters. They were beating, blasting, and throwing bodies all around like rag dolls. Eventually, the villains surrounded the two teens. The two of them looked around while on the defensive, trying to see who would attack their blind side first. But not one villain made a move. They were teasing them, testing them, trying to put them on edge. They had smug smiles with malicious intent gaming in them, and it pissed off Bakugu. End of the line, little heroes. One of the villains vexed them. You may be able to take us on one by one. Another added snarkily. But even you brats can't handle a whole horde. Another exclaimed while licking his sharp teeth. So any last words before we paint the walls with your bodies? The first one, who was probably the leader, asked. Just then, Kirishima saw something grab the villain behind the leader and pull him away into the darkness. And from the look on his face, that wasn't intentional. But Kirishima was more confused as he asked, Huh? The leader looked at him funny and replied, Huh? That's it? Just huh? What are you humming at anyway? The leader then looked over to where Kirishima was looking and saw the villain had disappeared. Hey, where's Ebony? He asked in the empty spot. Bonehead. Another villain asked in an empty spot. Nasher. Another asked. Britnander. Another asked. Fire Sheet. Another exclaimed. Topping. Another shouted. Pretty soon, the two dozen villains surrounding the two teens had been reduced down to a mere six, with the remaining villains looking around nervously for their comrades and whatever was picking them off. What are you kids doing? A villain yelled accusingly at them. We're not doing anything. 
I swear. Kirishima defended themselves. Even Bakugo was starting to get a little bit stressed out. Whatever was taking these villains was extremely fast, quick-witted, and sneaky to do it right under their noses. Bakugo was worried that whatever it was would eventually try to attack them. Just then, one of the villains in the smaller circle was pulled from sight and into the darkness. Everyone saw this and looked at the spot they heard and saw nothing. It was dead quiet and still as a grave until the villain burst out from the darkness screaming bloody murder. Everyone jumped back at this as the villain fell to the ground, trying to claw himself away from the darkness until something in the dark grabbed his foot and dragged him back as his nail carved into the ground with only the sound of his screams echoing out. After only a second after the screams faded out, another villain was grabbed, but then time by the neck. A female villain choked as she was hauled off her feet and pulled up into the darkness of the rafters. Then another was pulled by something in the darkness, but had the chance to grab onto one of the corners where the halls split off. But like the first one, his nail simply carved into the wall as he was pulled away. Then the most freakish one was an invisible force wrapped around one of the villains in the center, and then pulled him down into the ground, but not forced through the ground, phased through solid matter like a ghost. He screamed as his arms flailed for someone to save him, and eventually, another villain tried to come to his rescue but ended up getting pulled down with him. The two villains disappeared into the floor. Now only one villain remained, the leader, and right now, he looked about ready to shit his whole pants. His face was pale, his sweat was intense, his teeth chattered, his knees knocked against each other, his eyes dilated, and he made slight whimpering sounds. He then looked at the two teens still standing at the defense, and pointing his finger, he shouted in accusation, Y-U-T-2, S stop this R right in and now, we're not doing this. Bakugu yelled at him in stress, as the villain painstakingly looked around his surroundings like a frightened deer in an open field. He didn't notice the shadow figure rising up from the ground directly behind him. The figure rose so slowly that in the eyes of the teens, it appeared to take ages while they were still scared. Once the figure emerged, the villain didn't notice it until he felt a hot breath on the back of his neck. The villain immediately froze and slowly turned around while turning an even paler shade of white. The shadowy figure was far larger than him and had a triangular head. Its ghostly body was so long that it curved up towards its three-pointed head, which actually reached the top of said head. In addition, it had three sets of eyes, two big and four small, with each one opening individually. The man dared not move at seeing the horrifying visage standing right in front of him until it opened what looked like a mouth with light in it and began to spew out red-hot flames. The villain screamed as the fire ignited on his back, and he ran as fast as he could, while the shadowy thing breathed a huge fire ring around the teens and itself. The fearful screams of the villain trailed off into the darkness along with his burning outfit. The young heroes were perfectly freaked out at this sight, especially when the thing slowly turned around to face the teens and their bodies froze up in fear. The shadowy thing came closer, but the teens' bodies refused to move until the two sets of eyes on top of its head popped out and flew toward the teens and tackled right into Kirishima. Bakugo was so scared that he did not move until he heard Kirishima's screaming. The ash blonde teen turned around to help the teen but immediately stopped when he heard the screams of joy, not pain. That and he was rolling around on the ground giggling up a storm as whatever attacked him swarmed around him. Stop, stop, stop. That tickles. I'm gonna pee. I'm gonna pee. Kirishima laughed so hard that his face went the same shade as his hair. What the fuck? Bakugo questioned extremely confused. Kirishima got up, holding the two things swarming around him, and finally looking at them, he said between giggles, Dreepy. Dreepy. Bakugo questioned. But if those are dreepy, then that means that thing is actually. That Hugo trailed off to the shadowy thing still standing in the shadow of the fire until it moved to the light. Dragapult. Kirishima cried out excitedly while running up and hugging the large flying lizard on its huge head. Phew. Bakugo spat dryly at the dragon Pokemon. Dragapult retaliated by giving a lazy hiss while giving him the stink eye back. Bro, am I glad to see you here. Another few minutes, and we'd have been done for. Kirishima thanked the Pokemon as its young played in his hair and nibbled his fingers. Bakugo clicked his tongue and stated, Don't sell yourself short weird hair. Those fuckers only thought they had us because they got our blind spots. Suddenly an invisible object ran across the wall and lunged at Bakugo's back. But Bakugo quickly whirled around and grabbed the object and blew it up in his hands. The object turned out to be a hidden villain that had the looks and powers of a chameleon. Bakugo scoffed and continued saying, In truth, these guys are nothing but low-level criminals. Even if they did swarm us, we could have easily beaten them all. 
Hell, any of our classmates would have an easy time beating these suckers into the dirt. Hiroshima looked at him with a weird expression as he replied, Wow, bro, that that was actually nice of you to say. What? You think I can't be nice? Bakugu immediately snapped at him. It's not that. It's just that almost all the time you're like. Hiroshima trailed off calmly, trying to find the words to use until the Dreepy said it for him by making a sharp tooth expression of Bakugo's angry face, while making noises that sounded like the word die, over and over. Yeah, exactly like that. Hiroshima pointed at them with a slight giggle. Fuck you, baby dragons. Bakugo gave his middle finger to the baby dragons. They mimicked his expression, tone, and gesture with their tails acting as a middle finger right back at him, making Kirishima giggle slightly. Hiroshima then turned to Bakugo, proclaiming his love for his super manly attitude and declaring that he'd follow his lead through this epidemic. Bakugo looked at him weirdly and scoffed at him while telling him to do whatever the hell he wanted. And with Dragapult at our side, we'll have no trouble ending this mass attack. He declares to the Ash Blonde. Bakugo whips his head over to Kirishima and yells, And why the fuck would we need that stupid lizard anyway? He's fucking useless. Kirishima decided not to tell Bakugo how he single-handedly took down two dozen villains and how Bakugo didn't use Dragapult in his fight against Gar properly. Instead, Kirishima gave him a pouting expression and explained, Because these Pokémon that Gar raised are way stronger than us and will give us an easier edge against the villains. It would be dumb of us not to use them. Bakugo clicked his tongue, and waving off the red-headed teen, he stated, Whatever, you use the dumb lizard if you'd like. I'm sticking to my quirk. Hiroshima smiled at this, then remembered something as he asked, Hey, wait a minute. If Dragapult is here, then where's Gar? Dragapult made an odd noise, like a sound of distress, and floated towards the window, looking out with a bored yet worried expression. Is Gar okay, Dragapult? He asked, a bit concerned. Dragapult made another strange noise, but it was enough to send home the message. Trouble was brewing not too long ago, and Gar was somehow involved in it. Hiroshima gave the dragon his brightest determined smile, and declared, Then we'll help you protect Gar, so long as you help protect my friends. Dragapult looked over to Bakugu and then back to Kirishima with a face that seemed to ask if he was referring to him. But Kirishima just smiled at him, and Dragapult seemed to agree as the Dreepy locked back into his horns and the Pokémon stretched its tail out and offered its back to Kirishima. You're letting me ride you, Kirishima asked while pointing to himself. Dragapult appeared to nod, and the red-headed teen immediately began to act as giddy as a child while waving his arms excitedly, and then scrambling to hop on the dragon's back. Dragapult lifted into the air as Kirishima said to Bakugo, Come on, bro, hop on. It'll be quicker on Dragapult's. He's pretty much a living stealth plane. Bakugo scoffed and spat back. F no, I'm not putting my ass on that thing. You can ride on that overgrown reptile all you like. I have my own way of traveling. He motioned to his hands as they sparked up. Bakugu then launched himself out of an open window and flew off into the air over the ruins. After a brief moment of flying in silence, he eventually noticed something in his presence and turned his head to the side. He then saw Kirishima riding Dragapult right next to him, with Dragapult narrowing his eyes skeptically. The hell are you doing shitty hair? Though I told you to go and do whatever you wanted with the shitty lizard. He shouted at him, I am doing that, and I want to follow you. Plus, Dragapult is going in the same direction as you. I guess Gar is that way. He shouted back over the wind. Then that means Purple Fucker is still in the central area where we got separated. Bakugo thought aloud. Then what are we waiting for? Let's go. Ooh, Hiroshima shouted with glee as Dragapult picked up speed. Bakugo scoffed and thought to himself before blasting off after them, whatever shit purple fucker has gotten himself into, I'm sure he's pissing his pants right now. On-site office, Rotom traveled through the electrical lines in nanoseconds, looking for any sign of on-site technology. If this place had electricity and a security system, then there's a machine controlling it and sending out signals to the whole building. Rotom just had to find it. And he did, once he felt the urge of his body wanting to possess something, like when he did with Gara's phone, he knew he found it. Rotom popped out of the wires, looked around for the machines, and saw that he was inside some kind of on-site office. A place, no doubt for whoever ran this place, along with security, to rest and work. He saw a kitchen with all the fixings, including a washroom, a lawnmower for some reason, and an external landline phone. Seeing this, he immediately possessed it to try and make a distress call, but no luck as he only got static. Now he just needed to find the control panels that manipulated everything inside the USJ. 
Rotom zipped around the office and saw a sliding highly advanced door, no doubt the actual control office was in here. Rotom phased through the electric parts and saw a huge control panel that controlled the whole facility with several security monitors all around watching every aspect of the USJ. There was a large office chair with someone sitting inside of the seat. Rotom thanked Arceus for his luck and zipped in front of the chair to confront the man. He was ready to zap him out of anger for their predicament but stopped and immediately freaked out when he saw the guard. He was dead, with a sizable bleeding bullet hole in his head. The sight of the dead man made Rotom produce all kinds of electrical noises and zapping electricity all over the place. After he calms himself down and looks away from the corpse, he then goes to possess the control until he reaches UA or at least tries to unlock the door for the young heroes to escape but stops in his flight path when a deep and malicious voice stops him. Well, well, what do we have here? Asked the cold voice. Rotom slowly turned around and came face to face with a hooded villain that seems to have a gun fused with his arm. He throws a knife in the air and catches it over and over while moving closer to the frightened Pokémon. I've never seen anything quite like you before. What are you? He asks while bringing his shadowed face closer to the Pokémon's tiny body. Rotom doesn't dare move a bit as the man stares him down while he watches the knife get absorbed into his body. Hump, doesn't matter anyway. You're dead. He yells while pointing his gun arm at Rotom. Rotom makes a warning noise and zips away from the attack before he fires. Rotom then zips all around the man at a speed that he can't even track and begins to shoot widely. He eventually shoots himself into an outlet and hides there is electricity. Luckily the man didn't see the Pokémon hide, so he looked around the room for him. Come on out, you little pest. It'll be much quicker and less painful for you if you show yourself and stay still. The man shouts while cocking his gun arm. Rotom was really scared now. He'd never been in a battle before. Heck, the only things he's ever fought is malware, virus, and spam mail. He didn't have many moves or even a high level, so how's he going to stop this guy? He could try and sneak the control panel, but the villain might try and shoot it. Rotom knew he had no choice, he had to fight whether he liked it or not. It's good thing Gar trained with him, so he had a better understanding of it, but it was so much easier taking orders than giving them. Rotom thought up a plan, and once he knew it was good enough, he popped out of the outlet and floated a few feet from the villain. The villain turned around and saw the Pokémon, then exclaimed, There you are. Then aimed his arm gun at Rotom and fired. Rotom made a shadow ball and threw in retaliation. The two attacks hit and caused a smoke cloud to erupt. The villain covered his face to ward off the smoke, and once it dropped a bit, he saw a strange light in the cloud. Then it separated into three lights and burst from the cloud. The lights swirled around the man's eyes so fast that he immediately felt severe vertigo settle in. What the hell? What happened? Why do I feel so confused? The villain shouted while wobbling all over the place. Rotom smiled at seeing his confused ray take effect so well. He then burst out of the disappearing clouds with an electric ball between his lightning bolt arms and threw it at the villain. The ball hit, and the man screamed in pain as his body illuminated with the overflow of power. After a few seconds, the electricity stopped, and the villain fell to the floor unconscious. Well, I guess you could say he had a shocking experience with me. Rotom joked in his head. But now was not the time for puns, now was the time for action. So the small Pokémon zipped over to the control panel and took possession of the machine. He tried to get in contact with UAS system, but like last time only got static. He tried to wrap around the static with another frequency, but still, nothing worked. He had to think of something to do. Gar was depending on him, everyone was. He tried every form of communication, frequency, and other electrical communication to work. But nothing got through apart from one. Binary code. Rotom worked fast, nanoseconds fast, and sent the code straight to the principal's office. He spelled the words, help, sauce, danger, UJS invasion, in binary. After he was done working through the strain of trying to work through the jamming, he sighed and hoped that the pseudo-Pokémon was actually at his computer and could understand all the zeros and ones. After that, he then went into the control system and worked through the jamming static again. He unlocked every door, window, and any other opening in the whole mile-long facility. Rotom popped out of the control unit and laid on the ground in exhaustion. After recovering for a bit, he had to think of a way to get back to Gar and protect everyone else. Since he was on security, he saw when everyone fell through a portal and were scattered around. But how? He only managed to take that one guy down due to planning, time, luck, and environmental advantage. In this office, he was nearly unstoppable. Outside, he was as vulnerable as a Magikarp on land. 
Rotom then remembered the living area behind the security and control room filled with all kinds of electrical appliances for him to possess. He smiled and then zipped right through the doors again and took an inventory of all the machines he could use. A washer, a toaster oven, a fan, a lawnmower, and a refrigerator. This is gonna be good. He thought to himself while rubbing his lightning bolt arms. A little while later, outside the office door, the door suddenly busted down from the inside. Flying off the hinges and slamming into a rocky cliff the office was attached to. Out steeped Rotom's smiling face on a washing machine. Trailing behind him on currents of electricity or several other appliances floating in the air. Rotom now knew he was ready for anything. And that would come sooner than he'd expected when he heard the sound of explosions and fighting going on right below him. The office had a metal outlook platform that could view the whole facility, yet the noise was happening right below. He looked down, as best he could with a washing machine body, and saw three students being cornered by several villains on the cliff face. Or at least that's who he thought was cornered. Rotom decided to make this his grand entrance, and scooting towards the edge, he positioned himself over one of the villains and announced, the show doesn't end till the fat lady sings. Rotom then let out his biggest high C he could and threw himself over the edge. Meanwhile, at the bottom, the villains and young heroes heard the commotion from above along with the music note. The villains looked up and saw a large object hurtling towards them, and unfortunately, it was right above one villain. The villain tried to run away, but the object was too fast and crushed him in a huge bang. The villains and heroes looked at the small dust cloud that formed after the impact, and when it fell, they saw an orange washing machine with a blue core, blue eyes, and a toothy smile. Rotom, the teens exclaimed in surprise. Hello, Rotom greeted them. He then pointed his house pump at the villains and blasted them with powerful torrents of water one by one. The remaining villains couldn't retaliate or get away quick enough as they all fell within minutes of Rotom's attack. When there were no more targets, the only ones left were the young heroes, Shoji, Kota, Sato, and Ida, and Rotom. Sato cautiously approached the living washing machine and asked, Rotom, is that really you? No, it's Mutuo. Rotom sassed him. Sato sighed and confirmed, yeah, that's Rotom. What are you doing here, Rotom, and how did you do this? Ida asked breathlessly while gesturing to the washing machine. Well, first I'm saving your butts, and secondly, how did you forget I can possess any electrical object? Rotom shot back condescendingly. Ida only rubbed the back of his head awkwardly in reply, and also paled in fear of what Rotom would do if he possessed his computer with access to his search history. But really, I came here to try and get a message to Yue about dot 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 all this. He explained. The teen crowded around the Pokemon and bombarded him with questions like, Did it work? Did you get through? Rotom shuffled back a few feet and explained, in a way, I got a message out. I just hope that they got it. Also, I opened every door in the facility. You should escape while you can. The teen sighed as Shoji gave a thumbs up, saying, Thanks, Rotom. As the teen wanted to run off towards the nearest exit, they saw that Wash Rotom was moving in the opposite direction. Hey, wait. Sato called out before he left. Where are you going? Exit this way, right. He asked, confused. Rotom rolled his eyes and answered back snarkily, I'm gonna find Gar, of course. I was in the security feed, and I saw what he's been up to. And I know he's in some hot water now. Then let us help you, Shoji offered, while Ida Sato and Koda nodded in agreement. Rotom appeared to shake his head no and replied, no chance. I really appreciate it, but you need to run your butt straight to UA and tell them what's happened if my message didn't get through, along with keeping your butts out of harm's way. What about you? Ida asked. Rotom appeared to shrug as he called back, I'm already a ghost, what more could happen to me? Rotom then shot out from the washing machine and into the lawnmower, with the washing machine joining the other floating appliances. Mo Rotom then zoomed off with his new cutter engine running in rhythm. Though Rotom's internal state was anything like his possessed engine, his mind was buzzing with worry over Gar. He saw him fighting a huge black thing and just barely able to hold his ground, but for how long, he didn't know. And he didn't care to wait and find out, so he kicked up speed. I just hope I can get there quickly, Rotom stressed in his mind as he put on even more speed and ran through the facility with fluid ease. Central area, I'm totally pissing my pants right now, Gar screamed in fear. Gar screamed in terror as he and Volcarona were sent sailing into the air, while wrapped in the arms of the Namu, looking to crush them by falling to the ground at breakneck speed after it tackled them. You see after Gar and Volcarona made their grand re-entrance and declaration of war in front of the Namu. It then promptly let go of Aizawa, much to Gar's surprise, and tackled the duo in a huge Superman leap right into the air, wrapping its massive muscular arms around them and holding them tightly to crush them both on the way down. 
Volcarona tried to break them free by heating up its wings to the point the Numo's skin began to melt like chocolate while also stabbing it repeatedly with the stinger at the tip of its thorax, and trying to chew through its neck with his surprisingly sharp mandibles. Gar initially screamed at this, and without thinking, he blabbered out, I'm totally pissing my pants right now. Volcarona stopped attacking the Namu and looked back at his master with a gross expression in its huge eyes. Gar saw this and quickly corrected himself while yelling over the wind, it's a figure of speech. I'm not gonna do it, but we have bigger problems right now. He gestured to the ground, quickly becoming more detailed. Volcarona still tried to do what he was doing before, but nothing made Namu even flinch, not even sharpening the white hairs near its front and stabbing Namu's chest and arms like a pin cushion. Volcarona, use heat wave. Gar commanded while trying to wiggle Namu's finger. The Pokémon was unable to move its wings to flap them but still laid its already pressed wings on the inside of the monster's body and turned up the juice. The monster immediately went up in flames just like Tamura did, but it still refused to let go. It got even worse when the flames reached the hands where Gar was pressed up against the Pokémon's back. Gar screamed in terror as the flames began to burn away at his sweatshirt, which set Volcarona off into a tizzy, trying to escape quickly. We gotta weaken it another way. Use Giga Drain. Gar commanded as the flaming monster already burnt through the back of his sweatshirt. Volcarona then started to absorb the same green energy from the Namu's body when he weakened it before. But this time the Namu's body didn't just shrink down and become a limp noodle. Instead, it shrunk a little and puffed right back up, like it had gained a tolerance or immunity to the vitality attack. Gar was panicking and now started to cry as the ground only got closer, and the flames had begun to burn away at the back of his bodysuit, burning his skin. Volcarona was also panicking, worrying about Gar and its own safety. But the poor Pokémon couldn't do anything. He had to do something, something new, something that would help them escape. And so the bug Pokémon did just that. Looking at the healing wound where the Pokémon previously tried to chew through its neck, Volcarona then bit down hard into the wound. And using Giga Drain, it began to suck the green energy through its mouth. Namu's body then started to rumble and jiggled like jello, and in one second, the monster's entire body collapsed on itself and shrunk down so far it looked more like a skeleton with a sheet over its bones. This allowed Volcarona to break free from its now weakling grip, open his wings, and parachute to stop their descent. Namu fell to the earth with a weak flop, and Volcarona gently floated to the ground, where Gar immediately jumped off his back ripped off the burning sweatshirt from his body, and rolled around the dirt to put out the fire on his bodysuit. After the flames were out, Gar rolled over to his stomach and laid there huffing and puffing from the burning sensation on his back. Volcarona quickly came up to him and began to spread some of its black wing scales onto his burnt back. The scales sprinkled on his back and immediately relieved the searing pain. Gar pulled himself up from the ground and petted the giant bug on his head as a thank you. Volcarona gave off some happy bug whistling. Thanks for saving me there, Volcarona. I really owe you one. But how did you do it? It looked like you used Giga Drain to weaken it. But Giga Drain didn't work before, so what was that move? Gar asked while tapping his chin, and Volcarona tilted its head to the side. I guess you learned a new move in our time of desperation. I think we'll call it Vitality Siphon, he exclaimed, and Volcarona cried in agreement with the name. Vitality Siphon it is. Tamura was in shock from this sight. His Namu was so close to taking out the giant bug and the purple guy, but the bug pulled some hidden technique and nearly one-shotted his boss killer. Tamura was furious beyond belief. He'd only been here five minutes and so far, there was no All Might. A giant snake nearly crushed him to death. He was tossed around like a piece of meat and set on fire. The only things he accomplished during this quest were beating one of the summoner's familiars, beating a pro, separating and trapping the students, and watching the summoner nearly burn himself to death. And now his Namu was even worse off than the last time. He was weakened to a shriveled up state. In addition, the thing wasn't even moving, so he thought that the bug actually killed it in one go. Kimura wanted nothing more than to kill the summoner with his bare hands, but Kurajiri stopped him with his arm. Tamura glared at him with murder in his eyes, but the mist man kept his composure and told him to wait it out. The older teen was distracted, Eraser was down, and Namu was healing. Don't let the opportunity skid away, and he had an idea to get the upper hand. Tamura didn't want to but knew it was the most reasonable option, and Namu was still on kill the bug orders, so he listened to Kirajiri's plan. Gar turned to the two villains at the other side of the area, staring at them, and sent Volcarona out in front, ready to fight. But suddenly, a portal opened above the Pokémon's head and a stream of water, akin to waterfall, fell right on top of the firebug type. 
Volcarona screeched from the water and fell to the ground looking dazed. Gar ran to the Pokémon's side and tried to comfort it or at least stay by its side. This made Tamira smile coldly as he knew that Volcarona was softened up for the Namu to finish it off when it healed, and also disappointed that all it took was water to put it down. While Gar was keeping one eye on his dazed Pokémon and one eye on the villain duo, the Namu was already regenerating its body mass back to full power. At first, it looked like it had a normal physique, then toned, built, swole, and finally superhuman. The Namu shot to its feet and roared. This got Gar's attention and got it off guard. The monster turned on a dime and charged straight for the teen and Pokémon. Gar froze and stared at the monster barreling towards him with fists tight and ready to obliterate them. But Volcarona had one last thing going for him and pushed Gar out of the firing line with a gust from his wings. Gar saw the world move in slow motion as he watched himself move away from the attacker. The monster closes in, then slams its fist into Gar's down Pokémon. Volcarona's expression saying it was glad it could save him before changing to pain. The Pokémon's body then went flying across the ground and came to a skidding halt where he laid motionless. Gar's jaw dropped open in shock, and his body wouldn't move as he saw this unfold so quickly and out of his control. He reached out his arm in a pitiful attempt to save his Pokémon, his mouth open as if to call out to it, but no words escaped. The monster then charged at the code Pokémon to smash it again. But this time Gar was faster and returned to Volcarona before he could get hurt any further. Gar huffed and puffed in exhaustion and fear as the Namu looked around for the bug Pokémon to smash. Once the blood ran out of his ears, he heard a cold, dry yet malicious chuckle. Gar cocked his head over and saw the hand and missed villain approaching him casually. Gar shot to his feet and raised his fists defensively. Well, 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 the summon has finally run out of familiars to do his dirty work, and now he's all alone. Tamura vexed while advancing further to him. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and no one to protect you. Tamura smiled as he lifted his hands. Now that the bug's out of the way, I finally get to do what I wanted from the beginning. Tamura then launched at Gar, who tried to throw a punch in defense but was ultimately too slow for Tamura's surprising speed. Tamura easily dodged around the punch and slapped his right hand on Gar's chest. The material of his bodysuit withered away, and so too did his chest. The left breast turned black and started to rot away like a piece of old cheese. Gar screamed in pain from the feeling of his body being decayed at such a fast rate. He fell to the floor with Tamura right on top of him and still kept his hand pressed firmly on his chest. Gar tried to pull the hand off, but the pain was too unbearable, and Tamura had a death grip on him. Tamura then tried to use his other hand to attack Gar, which appeared to be heading for his neck. But the arm was still weak and injured from Superior, so Gar quickly grabbed the arm and began to squeeze it with all he could, especially on the wounded part where Superior bit into him. Gar squeezed with all he had and made the still freshly injured bleed out poison and blood. Gar squeezed his arm so hard that it actually began to break from all the adrenaline coursing through him. Eventually, there was a distinguished crack as his ulna and radius bones began to break Gar's grip and Tamura couldn't hold back the yell that escaped his throat. Gar pushed back while continuing to squeeze his arm, but this led to his other arm giving way and allowing Tamura's quirk to continue spreading. Tamura used this and pushed back, only to have his arm painfully squeeze and had himself pushed back because of it. It was a standoff, but it seemed that Tamura would be the winner due to his quirk starting to travel up the older teen's neck. Any last words before I rot you to a pile of dust? Tamura's red eyes narrowed into his soul. Gar struggled and gasped for air as the pain only seemed to grow with each moment, so his head was not in the right state as he replied. Plus, Ultra, Flood Zone. As the heroes and Jubile Pokémon flew towards the shoreline, Izuku told Tojkis to land in the water so they wouldn't be seen from the air, and potentially get caught by the villains in the hopes of getting a sneak attack. The four then swam the rest of the way to shore, which was only a few yards, and kept quiet as they started to hear a struggle. As they got closer, they heard the sound of a fight, things breaking, someone shouting, and someone screaming in pain. The heroes saw two figures a few feet from the edge of the water in a scuffle, one on top of the other, and the one on the bottom was trying to hold him off. When they were close enough to make out faces, they saw it was Gar and the hand villain in the scuffle, with the villain on top of Gar, causing him to scream in pain. Tojkis's feather ruffled up at hearing his master's cries of pain and tried to splash out of the water to save him but he was stopped by Tsuyu, who knew they had not been seen by the villain yet. And if they gave away their surprise, Gar could get killed, and they only had one chance. Izuku was the one who took the lead, swimming low and getting as close as possible. He saw that the villain was also in pain, as his bleeding arm was being held up and crushed in Gar's grip. 
Both are in pain and unable to overpower the other in a stalemate and had their full attention on one another. So Izuku knew he could surprise him, he'd just have to get closer. Once he did, he heard the snarky voice of the villain ask, Any last words before I rot you to a pile of dust? Izuku briefly wondered if that's why Gar was screaming in pain with the villain's hand just touching his chest and fighting off his other hand back. He also wondered what kind of quirk the villain had. In any case, he knew now that hands are equally bad. Izuku heard Gar struggling and gasping for air as he replied, Plus, Ultra, that's when Izuku shot out of the water, completely taking the villain by surprise, and punching him with one for all right into the chest, and sent him flying off Gar. The villain landed some ways away but quickly rolled back to a standing position, albeit with an expression reminiscent of trying to hold his lunch down. Gar looked up from his spot on the ground, and with happiness gleaming in his weakened eyes, he weakly said, Izuku, man, am I glad you're here. Izuku turned around to give Gar a reassuring smile, but it immediately left when he saw the state of Gar's left chest. It was bleeding heavily with most of the skin removed, raw and pink, showing muscle, with black veiny outline. He ran to Gar's side and put him into a sitting position as he tried to use a piece of his hero outfit to stop the bleeding. Are you okay, Gar? Izuku asked worriedly. You're my hero Izuku Midoriya. Gar answered back with a dazed tone. Oh god, he's delirious from the pain, shock, and blood loss. Izuku mentally panicked. Well, I didn't think any of you little heroes would actually make it back. Izuku heard the villain's voice behind him. Izuku turned his head around and saw the villain slowly approaching him like a predator with its cornered prey. Though that is my fault for thinking those low-class, two-bit, wannabes could actually kill you as I hoped. And on top of that, you interrupted me while I was about to kill your summoner. Izuku stood up and got into a defensive stance, standing between the villain and Gar. The villain made an amused sound in his throat at seeing him do this and stated, So, you wanna play hero for your friend over there? Well then, hero, I'll give you a first-hand experience of a hero's choice in a fight. I'll let my Namu kill you while I kill your other friends. And then we'll see who lives and who dies. Suddenly Namu appeared out of nowhere and ready to punch against Izuku. Izuku just saw Namu upon him and could move quickly enough to escape. But Tsuyu was, as she shot out her tongue to pull the green teen out of the way. But Tamura saw the other two teens and the Pokemon swimming to the shoreline and made a mad dash for the frog girl with his good hand extended out. Izuku saw the world move in slow motion as his brain still worked at normal speed. He saw Tsuyu still fully concentrating on saving him, the hand villain just inches from her face, Namu right upon him already throwing the punch. Gar on the ground finally coming back, realizing what was going on as his face was contorted with shock. Izuku could almost see the future in this slow motion and saw Tsuyu being turned to ash from the villain, the Namu smashing him to death, their entire class, and Aizawa being killed off one by one at the hands of the villain and his monster, and Izuku completely helpless to do anything. Suddenly, everything clicked right back into place as time seemed to come back. The hand villain touched Tsuyu's face. Tsuyu pulled Izuku out of Namu's attack just in time and was sent flying in the opposite direction. Izuku looked at Tsuyu in fear, but her face remained the same, and even the hand villain looked confused at Tsuyu's not decaying face. But then two and two were put together as he looked behind him and saw a racer's head just barely lifted up with his eyes glowing red. Humph thought you were finally dead. Guess not. That quirk of yours sure is annoying. Kimura monologues. Before anyone could do anything else, Minta showed his presence by shouting out, dazzling gleam. Tamura looked at the purple teen in surprise, just noticing him and wondering what the hell he was yelling. Until Tojkis, who also went unnoticed by him, finally sprung out of the water and peppered the villain with pink sparkles from his chest. The attack was powerful enough to send him flying back and away from the teens, which finally allowed Aizawa to deactivate his quirk and drop his head. Tojkis then took off into the air and began to pepper Namu with dazzling gleam. The Namu tried to swipe at the bird but couldn't even hit it due to its fast-flying maneuvers. While Tamura lifted himself from the ground, trying to rub away the pain from the fairy attack, the Namu was occupied with Tojkis, Suyu, and Mintia jumped out of the water and ran towards Izuku, who was helping Gar to his feet. Tamura was already pissed off having two of his kills stolen from him and having his monster outwitted yet again. This time he would make sure to kill all four teens in one go. Before Kirajiri could even attempt to stop Tamura from his attack, he was already off with blinding speed and closing fast. Minta saw the villain charging at them like a savage animal and screamed like a girl while freezing up. Tamura liked seeing this in his victims, and even more so that it was in all four of his victims' faces, which means this will be much easier and more fun for him. Just as he was halfway to the frozen teens, a scream could be heard from the distance, 
and said the scream was slowly becoming louder. The scream garnered the attention of Tamura so much he actually slowed his descent. He tore his head to the screaming and saw Kirishima on the back of Dragapult flying down toward the villain at top speed. Although, Kirishima wasn't screaming in fear or pain, but rather a war scream as if he were about to attack. The speed at which he was traveling was so fast that Kirishima's entire face was blown back, showing off his teeth, gums, and eyes. Tamura didn't even have enough time to react as Dragapult closed in too fast for him to even move, and Kirishima pushed the villain with his hardened fist. Tamura wasn't flying again but did not roll onto his feet like last time, but instead rolled across the ground and crumpled into the dirt from the impact of the punch. Not too far behind Kirishima and Dragapult was Bakugo who managed to sneak up on Kirijiri and was ready to blast him with a powerful explosion. However, Kirijiri quickly turned around with his pistol drawn at the young teen's head and ready to pull the trigger. Suddenly Kirijiri saw something from his peripherals that made him shudder. A pair of shiny glitter eyes that held more malicious intent and cold aura than his body has ever experienced. The shock and fear were so much that it caused him to flinch for a moment. But it was all it took for the eyes to dash to his side and slam something made of wood into his hand and knock the pistol straight out. This gave Bakugo more than enough opportunity to send off the explosion on the distracted villain and then pin him down by his metal head brace with black smoke wafting from under his hand threateningly. I know your little trick, Mist Man. Your smoky parts are intangible. But there's gotta be something solid holding that shit together. I see this huge choker you're wearing and put two and two together. So unless you want to be blown to shit stains all over the floor, you're gonna stay there in the dirt where you belong, you hog. Bakugo threatened the oddly calm villain. Tamura made a hump sound in his throat and told Bakugo vexingly, That's some very unheroic talk there, boy. Thought you heroes were all about second chances in disarming the villains, not de-arming them. He vexed. Just then, Mimiku appeared from below Kirijiri's body, standing on top of it, and hissed at the hand villain while making a point of slamming his wooden tail into the mist man's neck brace, causing it to bend and the man to grunt in pain. Bakugo scoffs and says, So you finally decided to show yourself, a eh, gremlin? Took you long enough, nice wood hammer. Mimiku only hissed back in response, whether to agree or just to get Bakugo to stop talking was unknown. I wondered what happened to that one. No matter, I'll just rot it to ash while Namu has his fun with you wannabe heroes. Tamura started with a cruel smile. Mimikyu did not like this in the slightest. His eyes glittered brightly with his own malicious intent as dark matter swirled around his true mouth, and then shot out in a spiral-like beam directly at Tamura. Tamura dodged with ease and then went on the run. Mimikyu hissed at this but didn't leave his spot on Kirijiri's head, almost as if he wanted to make sure the mist man didn't try anything funny. Bakugo could tell Mimkyu was having a conflict and said to the Pokémon, Hey Gremlin, you wanna go blast that guy? Mimiku appeared to shake his false head rapidly. Bakugo smiled and said, Then go fuck up hand job, real good. I got a metal neck under wraps until you or the heroes finally get here. Mimiku. Mimiku cried as he hopped off Kirijiri's head and shuffled away. Just before he fully left to chase down Tamura, he came back and very quickly slapped Kirijiri with his fake tail, making the men grunt again. Mimiku's eyes glitter again, and the tiny Pokémon dashes off with surprising speed as he keeps in hot pursuit of the hand villain trying to cover some ground. Bakugo smiles at the Pokémon, almost proud of it, until Kirijiri asks vexingly, So, I suppose he's your son. Fuck you, he replies. Mimiku chases after the surprisingly quick villain with his surprising speed and catches up in moments. Mimiku shoots out a hand to swipe at the man but he catches it in his hand with a sinister look on his face. After a moment, nothing happened to Mimikai's hand as it extended further and began to wrap up the man's hand and arm. Tamura was in shock of this and even more so when the small Pokémon threw him over his head with a surprising amount of strength. Tamura lifted himself and squeaked out in pain. What the hell? Suddenly Mimikyu dashed up to the villain, who froze up in shock, and the two of them disappeared in a cloud of smoke with a bunch of cartoony sound effects and objects flying all over the place. Tamura was shot out of the dust cloud and laid on the ground with swirls in his eyes. Now that's what I call a play rough. Mimikyu heard Gar's voice cheer for him. Mimikyu turned around with the happiest expression in his eyes as he ran up to his master and jumped into his arms, snuggling into his chest. Gar held back his groan of pain as the small Pokémon slammed right into his left breast and tried to let it out in a puff of air. Holding back his tears, he said in a croaking tone, It's good to see you too, buddy. Mimikyu looked up at Gar's face with tears still running down his own as his body shuddered with happiness. Gar petted the Pokémon's disguise and said kindly, 
biding out your time for the right moment as usual, eh hey buddy? It must have been really hard, doing all the waiting and never knowing what the right moment was. Even going so far as to watch me suffer when you knew you couldn't jump in yet. At this point, Mimikyu began to cry full tear streams as he looked up at the older teen like a hysterical child. Gar wiped his tears away while cooing softly in a reassuring tone. Hey hey, don't cry. You're a real trooper, you know that. You played your card in a gamble, lost a bit, but won some more. You saved Bakugu just in the nick of time and gave that Tamura guy a good thrashing. I'd say you really outdid yourself. Mimikyu then shot out both his arms and wrapped them around his neck, pulled himself in close, and snuggled into his cheek. So that's his name, Tamura, Izuku asked. Pulling the Pokemon away from his face, he replied in a serious tone, Yep, but that's not important right now. What is important is trying to take that thing down. He motioned to the monsters, still trying to catch Tojkis, who at this point was only playing with the monster. Gar gave an angry sigh, growl and explained, Volcarona and Superior threw just about everything we had at that thing, and it still won't go down. And by the looks of it, Tojkis won't be able to distract it much longer. We need all the hands we can get right now, he stated firmly while seeing Tojkis's trying expression. Mimiku then lightly slapped Gar's face with his hands and waved them in front of his eyes as if to make a point. Gar chuckled and said, Yes, your hands will do perfectly. Mimikyu pumped his arms up in victory and turned around in Gar's arms while glaring hatefully at Namu. Then I guess you'll need him back, Hiroshima stated while climbing off Dragapult. Dragapult came over to Gar, offering his head, which he petted and smiled, saying, Sure will. He looked around at what he had so far, Tojkis, Mimikyu, and Dragapult. It wasn't anything amazing, but it was still leagued better than before. But Gar knew he needed more. That thing took out two of his Pokémon with minimal effort. But who else was around to help? Suddenly a loud roar could be heard from the distance. Everyone turned their attention to the roar and saw Gerardo's breaking through a tree line. Did somebody order the fish? Kaminari shouted as he, Gyro, and Momo rode on his head. Upon seeing Gar, Gerardo's charged straight into the battleground, unknowingly and nearly running over Bakugo and Kirijiri in the process, making Bakugo let go of the Mist Man to dodge the oncoming fish and allowing the Mist Man to escape. Gerardo's, I'm so glad you're all right, Gar shouted while waving his arms excitedly. Gerardo's roared back happily with tears glittering in his extremely pissed off eyes, and made me lose my hold on the metal neck, you dunce face. Bakugu shouted at Kaminari, hiss, Mimikyu hissed at him from Gar's shoulder. Oops, Kaminari rubbed the back of his head. The giant fish finally made it to the group and arched its head down to rub against Gar affectingly, which he did, allowing all three teens to slide off his massive head and join the rest of them. Gar smiled at seeing this. Now he had all four of his other Pokémon with him and was able to fight that monster. And seeing that several of the students were alive and well really took some stress off his shoulders. But he couldn't help but feel like he forgot something or someone. Just then, Namu managed to catch Tojkis in a good spot and grab the bird with both hands. Tojkis chirped in protest, trying to escape the monster's iron grip. Suddenly an orange lawnmower with a sharp smile ran into the area with several appliances trailing behind it on streams of electricity and ran over Namu's foot. The mower made a strange sound, like when it runs over something that clearly isn't grass, and the Namu roared in pain while loosening its grip on Tojkis, who flew away. When the mower moved out of the way, Namu's foot and a portion of its leg had been sliced clean off, revealing the bone. Did someone call a gardener? Buzzed. The mower asked while sliding in like a drifter with a cocky smile. Rotom. The teens asked. In the flesh or lawnmower? Buzzed. Rotom answered. I didn't know you could possess everyday objects. Hiroshima exclaimed in awe while touching Rotom's push handle. Rotom moved out of the way and, in a huff, exclaimed. How is this a surprise? We've literally covered this back in Chapter 2. Buzzed. Everyone looked at the lawnmower Pokemon strangely as he followed up, saying. Anyway, I'm here to help. Buzzed, I've already sent a message to Yue along with a messenger, and unlocked all the doors. Buzzed, Gar, along with everyone else in the group, sighed in relief at that sentence, fully relieved that the rest of their friends were safe and help was on its way. Gar closed his eyes to rest for a moment as he said, Well, I guess the gangs are all here. He opened his eyes, and looking at Tojkis, he shouted, Tojkis, to me. Tojkis stopped for a moment, but only for a moment which was all the Namu needed to grab the bird again. But this time, he was stopped by a wave of ice that covered half of its lower and upper body, covering its legs and one of its arms. Tojkis flew back to Gar's side, snuggling into his face, as the group wondered what in the world saved Tojkis. Then they saw a very familiar set of red and white hair appear from the side and join them. 
the teens, especially Gar, were both impressed and terrified how accurately Todoroki could use his ice. How strong it was, how fast it was, and how he managed to literally manifest out of nowhere then join the battle like nothing just occurred. Gar sighed, and while keeping his eyes firmly planted on the Namu, he stated to the younger teens, The rest of you get Aizawa and yourselves out of here now. There was no room for discussion in his voice. The group didn't argue with him as Suyu and mine to help pick Aizawa up and carry him away to the nearest exit. While Momo and Jiro were making and carrying medical supplies for Aizawa once they were safely away. Once they were out of sight, Gar saw that Todoroki, Izuku, Bakugo, and Kirishima were the only ones still standing there with him. He went to open his mouth but was cut off by Bakugo, who seemed to know what he would say. No fucking way, he firmly stated. Gar huffed in aggravation and shot back, This isn't a discussion, Katsuki. You're getting a racer and getting out of here with the others. Bakugo bared his teeth while clicking his tongue, annoyed while saying, You said it yourself, purple fucker, that thing is strong as fuck. You need all hands on deck. It even took down two of your shitty Pokemon. Gar gave the ash blonde a deadpan look as he took in a deep breath and ranted off. First off, how dare you call my Pokemon shitty when you're the living embodiment of that word. Second, I only had two Pokemon to battle with and now I have five. I'll be fine. I just have to keep that thing distracted long enough for All Might to get here. Now go. He half shouted the last part, but not one of them moved. Instead, they all stood firm in fighting stances, ready to take on the monster. Gar saw their determination brewing in their eyes, just like Volcarona. Gar looked at the fainted Pokémon's Pokeball and, with a sigh, finally yielded. I'm really not gonna be able to convince you for Dadu, am I? He asked the group in a low tone. Nope, Hiroshima exclaimed. Gar sighed in exasperation and finally said, Fine, fine, have it your way. But try and keep up K, boys. I like to play rough and competitive. He said the last part with a determined smile. I'll blast that freak's head clean off before your Pokemon can even charge an attack. Bakugo challenged. Girados stood up tall with his long body protecting their rear in defense. Tojkas circled around them anxiously. Mimikyu's rage face was engaged with one sharp arm out. Dragapult's eyes glowed a bright yellow as flames pooled out from his mouth. And the Dreepy chattered and slobbered wildly in excitement, while Mo Rotom revved his engine to the max. Kurajiri finally appeared next to the downed and dazed Tamura, helped him into a sitting position while asking, Young sir, are you okay? Give me the healing potion, and I'll be fine. Tamura choked out angrily, but Kurajiri tried to reason with him. Now, Tamura yelled at him. Kurajiri reached into his suit pocket and deposited a capped syringe. Tamura snatched the syringe and jammed the needle into his neck while pulling the plunger. Tamura felt new energy flow into him as he finally sat up with Kurajiri's help. He sat there for a moment while breathing heavily from the rush he felt surging through him. After getting back his equilibrium, he rotted the syringe in his hand, and under his breath, he growled, that little toy. Hey Tamura. Tamura heard Gar shout his name. The villain shot his head up and saw something that nearly made him freeze in place. Gar with five of his Pokémon around him and about several of the Wana students at his side. Tamura lifted himself to his feet while keeping a hatful glare on him. Gar tapped his chin, after getting no reply, and asked, What was it you said to me before? Oh right, any last words before we stomp your monster and send you to the big house on a stretcher? He stated boastfully while shooting out an arm towards him, while all his Pokémon gave off their fighting cries. Tamura made a face, something crossed between a malicious smile and a pissed-off frown as he looked to the half-trapped Numo and commanded it, tear him apart. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 3. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.